back again. Well, we've made it all the way to the epic conclusion of Rosemine's third year in the Royal Academy. After blowing expectations out of the water, turning noble culture on its head, and getting roped into a massive game of treasure-stealing ditter, what's really left to cover? It's just the Interduchy Tournament, right? Well, yeah, but there's a lot that can happen during that short span of time. But before we go ahead and get into that, I do have my obligatory plugs to get through. There should be like a subscribe animation playing around here. Uh, go ahead and check that out. Helps you stay up to date with content from me. I've still got merch on sale as well. The Rosemine Gremlin design as well as the Dunkelfelger Ditter team. And Rosemine Garden shirt too. And with those out of the way, let's go ahead and dig into Part 5, Volume 3. The prologue begins from Matthias' perspective, right after Anastasius questions everyone involved in the Ditter match last volume. Things got sticky there, but matters were settled, and Rosemine isn't going to marry out of Aaronfest. At least that's what he thinks. Mostly Matthias was relieved to have protected his lady, but he can't exactly rest easy. Something caught his attention when they were saying their farewells, and he got closer to the knights who interrupted their game. Specifically, a sweet scent. Now where has he smelled that before? Well, back in the dorm, he gathers the rest of the retainers to discuss what happened. It's not just the knights. Brunhilde was involved in the match too, so she's there. And since he and Lorenz can't see Rosemine on the third floor because they're boys, they get an update on her health. It's not good. Her fever's really bad, and she's struggling to breathe. This is especially hard on Brunhilde. She feels responsible since she was in the shield and fainted, so she wasn't able to stop Rosemine from overexerting herself. Judith says it's her fault for attacking Lest a lot and getting flung out of the shield, but uh, that's kind of her job. She couldn't really be blamed for defending her lady, right? Well, no. The fact that they built their strategy around Rosemine as a key figure was their failure. She shouldn't have really been participating in the match. This is Matthias and Lorenz's real introduction in what it means to serve Rosemine. They misunderstood their role, assuming it was to grant their lady's wishes. But no, protecting Rosemine comes above all else, even above granting her own desires. The students in Ehrenfest relied on her and pushed her past her means because of their weakness, so they're the ones to blame. Hindsight's 2020. They should have stopped Rosemine as soon as the match was called. You know, make her drop the shield, but she didn't. This is like a gut punch to Matthias. He wants the record set straight, or else this will cause friction down the line. So Brunhilde lets Matthias and Lorenz know what really happened back during Charlotte's baptism, and why granting Rosemine's wishes isn't always in her best interest. She ordered her knights to protect Charlotte, and was poisoned as a result. Bonifati has trained her guards from that day forward, drilling into them that their number one goal is protecting the Archducal family no matter what. Rosemine in particular has more creativity than stamina, so she always gets carried away easily. They need to be a voice of reason, since, well, she lacks one, especially with Ferdinand gone. The topic then shifts to Wilfried. They get brought up to speed on how her other retainers view him as an absolute insufferable oaf. But this ditter game was the last straw, creating irreparable harm to their working relationship. While his defending Rosemine was good, after he rescued Hannah Laura, she became his main concern, even as his future first wife was about to pass out. Though I'm sure he's worried about her, right? Probably not, considering he was celebrating with the Knights after the match, and then had the balls to suggest a rematch right away despite Rosemine's poor health. And on top of that, while she's struggling for her life here, he hasn't even thought to send her a single get well present or anything. What an absolute bum. Sure, her damn near dying is fairly normal from his perspective, but they're supposed to be engaged and he doesn't act like it at all, which is frustrating as hell for her retainers. Hell, their engagement is entirely for his sake and he's completely oblivious to it. Now here's an interesting tidbit. Veronica's faction assumed that Wilfried would be the ob to maintain balance, but that's some serious cope. After the purge and punishments are doled out, the Lies Gangs will be the dominant political faction in Ehrenfest. And Wilfried made the stupid decision to turn down Dunkelfelger's opening into the royal interrogation of those knights. Yeah, even Matthias was frustrated there. Oswald's the one who told Wilfried to decline, because if there's anybody worth listening to, it's a flaccid puppet like him who's used to Ehrenfest's bottom-ranking status. But back to the aftermath of the game, Matthias recalled the smell he noticed. It's likely Trug was used on the Knights. Now they're really worried, because that means that Georgine has a connection to the Knights Order and the Sovereignty, though Matthias made the right call not to bring that up in front of the Prince, because this is going to be a serious problem going forward, and they need to consult Ehrenfest. So there's a lot packed into this prologue that's worth noting. The deeper dedication Rosemine's retainers have to their lady and why they have it, Wilfried's failure as a future husband will become relevant next book, and then the reintroduction to Trug at a key moment in the story. These things don't just build the world, they're relevant later on. 
some earlier than others, but all do come back in a big way, so tuck them in the back of your mind for now. Back to Rosemind's perspective, she's in and out of consciousness as her fever fades. She saw Riarda first and apologized, but she's just happy that Rosemind's recovering. The next time she wakes up, Brunhilde is holding her hand. It's pretty rare for her noble mask to slip, but this is one of the rare times it actually does, and she's beside herself with regret. Rosemind tries to get her to feel better by saying this wasn't her fault, but no, she won't accept it. She should have been conscious to stop her, so she failed. So they're basically at a stalemate here. Rosemine wants to forgive her, and Brunhilde won't accept it. That is until Lisa Letta intervenes. He tells Brunhilde to leave it at that since Rosemine's not fully recovered yet. And suddenly, with the flip of a switch, her noble mask is back. Rosemine expresses her regret that this may have put a black mark on her record, but Brunhilde dismisses the thought, saying this is a personal regret of hers. It's not going to affect her professionally, though both here are probably true, based on the attending course's grading standards. As Brunhilde leaves, she asks Rosemine not to drink too many potions again, just as Riarda said before, and she makes that promise. Yeah, this time it's definitely more serious, as Rosemine sits put until she's allowed to leave her bed, not even asking for books. She knows her retainers were worried about her, but one day Lisa Letta brings over a stuffed shoe mill for Rosemine. Yeah, it's fucking adorable. And they have the magic tool ready, so she records some messages for Ferdinand. Simple warnings like is he sleeping enough, eating enough, and not overworking himself. But as she finishes, it strikes her that he would throw this away as soon as he's home. She's not wrong. Right, she better gift it to Eustace then. But just then, Felina enters with reports and mail from Aaronfest. Oh, and one of these is from Letizia. That's weird. Apparently, part of the education she missed when she was in a coma would have been writing letters to nobles and other duchies. The goal of which is learning noble phrasing and getting information over the gate without opposing nobles interfering. Neat. This is also a task for her, since she needs to practice this as well, and also to serve as an example for Letizia. Yikes. And Ferdinand's gonna be in the academy to escort that Lynn soon, so she should probably get a move on on this. After reading through the letter, the noble euphemisms go over her head a bit, but Riarda helps her parse it, and it's basically just complaining about how strict Ferdinand is. He is a good teacher, but he holds Letizia to Rosemine's standards. That's not cool. So she summons Lisa Letta and has her make another shoe mill. This one's gonna be for Letizia to weaponize against Ferdinand, so she's on it. But what Rosemine's more interested in is the letter from Ferdinand himself. Too bad she can't read it just yet, and has to wait until she's better. And three days after their dinner game, she finally is. After heading down to the dining hall, she hears more pressing reports. Wilfried says that Aaron Fest thinks the game is invalid, while Dunkle Felger refused and upholds that it is. Sounds like a pain. So Rosemine says they'll drop the whole Hannah Laura marrying into their duchy, and they can just get them to agree to leave them alone. And then he tells her what Anastasia said to him, that basically the royals don't think he's capable of protecting her. And I mean, they're not wrong, but right as she's about to cheer him up, Charlotte says they received a report that Hildebrand offhandedly complained about the dinner game in front of the knights, who then most likely assumed it was an order to stop Dunkelfelger from winning Rosemine. Anastasia scolded him for that, but it wasn't an order in the first place, so really there's not much they can do. Just some overzealous knights. Or rather, Rosemine and Hannah Laura, since they're the ones who told Hildebrand about the game in the first place. And if Aaronfest is gonna send Rosemine to another duchy, the royals would rather just order her into their family, but weird such loyal knights would go against orders, right? Well, Matthias mentions that whole drug smell on them, and that connects a lot of dots. He says he's not certain, but Matthias is a pretty cautious dude. If he was confident enough to mention it, he must be pretty damn sure. But is Trug common in the Royal Academy? No. Pretty much all of Charlotte's scholars are taking the herbology classes and haven't heard anything about it. So they just assume it probably only grows in one duchy and isn't really dealt with outside of it. So the natural question comes up, do they tell the royal family? Well, they best get Sylvester's approval first. Because Georgine used it originally, there's a very likely chance she has an associate in the Sovereign Knight's Order, meaning she might be able to return to Ironfest much easier than they expected. The shadow looming over this scene is so dark, it's practically a solar eclipse. The timeline becomes clear around Book 5, and when you know, you can't unsee it. Okay, well, forgetting about the monster trying to kill her and destroy their duchy for a second, the interduchy tournament is coming up and they have a ton of prep work to do. Yeah, it got closer while Rosemine was asleep. This year is already shaping up to be a bigger burden than last, with three joint research projects and a connection to the king himself after the dedication ritual. 
Yeah, if Aaronfest was a hot commodity before, they're gonna be massively in demand now. The research itself is pretty much settled, save for Arensbach, but that pretty much just requires her to read the letter from Ferdinand to sort out. Rymoon's gonna present it, so there's not really much for Rosemind to actually do. As for Juanchel, well, that's a complicated story. Aaronfest will present how to improve and what they're doing with Fey Paper, but each duchy will present the magic tools they made with them. Similar to what was decided with Dunkelfelger. That pretty much makes sense, since Wilfried was involved in that discussion too. But it's definitely lopsided since Juanchel basically stole Aaronfest's idea after they told Gundolf about automating the music playing process with Heffen Paper. However, they went in a completely different direction. They made self-playing instruments, and Aaronfest lacks the manpower to actually keep up with that. Yeah, this will reflect poorly on Aaronfest if they can't keep up with their own research partners. But while Charlotte is worried that Rosemine is going to get mad at the scholars, Rosemine wasn't worried about it at all. This was all just advertising for their Fey paper in the first place, while gaining an understanding of its properties. However, not having something a note to present is definitely an issue. For that, she has a devious idea. The self-returning books for one, which she wanted anyway, but where Juanchel made self-playing instruments, she wants a music box that requires almost no mana. Yeah, piggybacking off their research with Arnsbach, they can make a magic tool so mana efficient, even commoners could run it with low-quality face stones they hunt themselves. Now, music boxes are possible without magic. Obviously, we have them in our world. But Johan's a pretty busy guy. She doesn't want to pull him for more important work. Ignaz and Marianne can't really keep up with this discussion, but Roderick and Felina follow along easy enough because they're already familiar with this research. And with a fire lit under them, the two arch scholars tackle this new task. They switch gears to Dunkelfelger's research again, where they're planning to include the opinions of those who attended the dedication ritual. Charlotte already gathered those while Rosemind was busy with that whole dinner prep thing. And Muriela has some news on that front too. A new case study has emerged at the last second. Yeah, remember Lou Arati? She actually managed to secure divine protection from the goddess of sprouts, a common goddess associated with blossoming romances in Elvira's stories, since she hadn't completed her ritual before attending the dedication one. Pretty weird she would go for that one of all gods, but Rosemine picks up pretty quick that she and Muriela were good friends, and probably romance nuts together. As a reward for helping confirm their research, Rosemine permits Muriela to lend her the latest volume of the Royal Academy Love Stories. With that, Rosemine retires to her hidden room to tackle the homework from Ferdinand. The letter in question informed her how to use her graphs, and as expected, that's going to be revolutionary, and Ferdinand even speculates that might draw more attention than the actual research. Though to be fair, he doesn't know its full extent, so that's probably not happening, while also dropping the bombshell that he'll be staying in Aaronfest's tea party room during the tournament because Detlind is being selfish. Big surprise, she wants her fiancé to greet her at the tea party room, like what's been written in the Royal Academy love stories, which has caught Ferdinand in a pretty awkward position. He can't come back to Aaronfest Orm because, while he's still a citizen of Aaronfest, he's too intertwined with Arnsbach's political situation. They're worried he's gonna leak information, which he would. Thus, this is their compromise. He'll stay in their tea party room. In her hidden room, she reads the secret part of the letter, and it's basically just him wondering why she stopped writing after taking the royals to the underground archive. Wow, that feels like ages ago. Well, she has a lot to tell him, and since she doesn't want to get yelled at, she's very selective with the plain and hidden letter. So with a hope and a prayer, she calls it there. It's honestly pretty funny because Rosemine did so much that's absurd last book, even the common knowledge stuff is going to give Ferdinand a headache. But at the same time, it's also not really his problem. He's not a citizen of Aaronfest anymore. So Wilfried sent a letter to Aaronfest about the whole trug crap, and their response said what they expected. Keep their mouths shut and let Sylvester handle it. This is beyond their pay grade and they have research to finish. So with that, Wilfried helps with the Juanchel stuff because they need mana, while Rosemine heads to Hersher's lab to finish up with Rymund. She hands over the letter for Ferdinand and asks how the research is going. They got permission to present the sound recorder and the library tool, so good on that front. But he also wants her help brewing another tool, a document searching one based off Schwartz and Weiss, one that's extremely mana efficient by cutting out that whole speaking thing. Ursher says that it's valuable, but won't really grab much attention due to how niche it is. However, that only makes Rosemine vow to create more libraries to raise its value. She brings up their plan to use Rymoon's work in their Juanchal research, asking for his permission to do so, and he thinks that's pretty weird, since it's her paper and her magic circles. But this is about marketing. This kid needs to realize his value, and she's helping out where she can. Benno drilled that into her back in part one. Frau Larm comes up here, where apparently she didn't think that Aaronfest did enough to warrant this being joint research. She thinks they should just be helpers. But screw that. 
Ferdinand and Detland outrank her ass, but why the hell is she so pissy when Rosemine and Aaronfest are involved? So, even the most casual of readers could probably pick up that Frau Larm hates Rosemine at this point, but you probably assumed it was the High Beast incident, and no, it's not. We finally get the real reason here. It's because Rosemine put her little sister in a bind by being punished along with her husband. Frau Larm is Count Bendewald's sister-in-law, and wow, talk about a pair. Georgine cozied up to her under the guise of atoning for her duchy's sins, but obviously that's not the real reason. We'll find that out later on. Well, I guess there weren't any chances of them being friends. While the girls who got turned away at the ritual are buddying up to Frau Larm and Georgine, the Arnsbach scholars who actually got in now see Ferdinand in a much more positive light, since he has experience with the temple. But this does raise the question, if Ferdinand is going to be here, how the hell will Arnsbach survive without an Archduke candidate to supply mana? Well, the duchy won't run dry in a day, I guess, so basically it's fine. As Rosemine brews and Rymoon bails back to his dorm, she and Hersher chat about Ferdinand coming. Apparently he could have stayed in the Arnsbach dorm if he really wanted to, using his silver tongue but this shows just how much he wishes to return home, even for just a day. But this does lead to a more important discussion, besides making Ferdinand comfortable. Their research isn't just causing him headaches, it's drawing a lot of attention from other duchies. They're going to be swarmed by sovereign scholars during the tournament, but that's not all. The lower-ranked duchies turned away during the dedication ritual were openly spiteful until the dinner game. Then they at least tried to cover it up with a smile. Those who had participated, though, see Aaronfest's clear connection to the royal family now, and have changed their tune quite a bit. But Hersher still hears mostly complaints. From the rumors around Sylvester, to Aaronfest's trickery in making those duchies play ditter against Dunkelfelger, and then to still get turned away and embarrass themselves in front of the royal family? Then they answered the Sovereign Knight's Order's call to interrupt the ditter game, and only got disgraced more. Hersher clarifies where this comes from. Aaronfest was a bottom-ranked duchy only a few years prior. Then Rosemine joined the academy the year they jumped from 14 to 13. That actually comes up in the short stories collection. They mocked their trends as only being a passing fad, but now their tune has changed. Rosemine is said to be the one propping up Aaronfest now, and I mean, they're not wrong, but while she didn't do everything alone, she was the impetus for most of these changes, so she needs to be mindful of how other duchies view her, that being as a high-mana, influential Archduke candidate. When Raimund returns, Lisa Letta enacts her master plan by buttering him up. She asks how he plans to present their research, and when he doesn't quite know, she springs into action. They can solidify Rosemine's involvement with a stuffed shoe mill being the vehicle for the sound recording magic tool. Well, Hersher can't really argue with that, but will it be done in time? This is Lisa Letta we're talking about, so... Yeah, and when they're back in the dorm, she finishes it right away. Next, they need to decide what to actually record. Muriella has a suggestion. Why not use a selection of spicy lines from the Royal Academy love stories? Sounds great, but who's gonna read them? Well, Matthias is too embarrassed, but Lorenz is a smooth operator and volunteers. After they record the lines, Rosemine throws in the last one for good measure, an advertisement for Aaronfest Books. Well, I think they've officially secured their involvement in the research so Detland and Frau Larm can't actually steal it. The day before the tournament, Wilfried and Charlotte's scholars emerge with the finished tools for their presentation. They have improvements in mind, but there's no time to actually put them in place. And with the Archduke candidate's approval, they're good to go. It's honestly impressive they managed to finish them so quickly. In fact, they want to know even more about Aaronfest's paper before the presentation, so she gives them a crash course. The rest of the day is spent in the dorm. Pound Cakes arrive in the castle, along with the latest volume of Farinestein. She can't quite send that out to Hannah Laurie yet, so they're gonna have to wait until after the tournament. She has to read it first, after all, and not just because she's Rosemine, but because they need to verify its contents, and we are to make sure she doesn't try to slip in some reading time herself. But they do inform Hannah Laura via Ordnance that they'll deliver it after the tournament and before they head home. Well, we're finally here. The Interduchy Tournament after a really big year in the Academy. This one lacks the flashiness of years past, but contains a ton of information still. So let's get on into it. Make sure you have your lore notebooks ready. On the day of the tournament, Wilfried and Charlotte head out while Rosemine stays behind. The reason being, they aren't entirely sure what those lesser middle duchies that attack them will do. 
Wilfried's already asked Sylvester to bring more guards to keep her safe, so she's waiting until he arrives. So to kill time and not feel like a waste, she follows Riarda to the tea party room to see how it's set up for Ferdinand. It's been partitioned off with screens to create rooms. One for him to sleep, one to eat in, and the area closest to the door where the retainers can sleep as well. But that probably won't happen much. Eustace and Eckhart don't really need fancy accommodations, and the Arnsbach attendant he'll bring will likely be too on edge to sleep. They already brought his bench on over from Aaronfest, per Rosemine's request, so at least he gets something soft to sleep on. The plan is for her and Wilfrey to eat with Ferdinand for dinner, while Sylvester eats with the students to congratulate them this year. Sounds good. And to avoid her inevitable scolding, she has ink and paper prepared so he can copy down Hersher's research as a decoy. But once the parents and guardians start to arrive, Rosemine spots Cornelius, Hartmut, and Angelica among the crowd. Why are they there? Well, Clarissa and Leonor are graduating, Hartmut has crap to iron out with her parents too. Because, you know, a letter's not gonna solve it. Hell, he actually needs to discuss the very likely situation where Clarissa goes rogue and comes to Aaronfest uninvited. Assuming the engagement gets cancelled, but since the king participated in the dedication ritual, chances are they might be able to salvage this engagement anyway. As for Angelica, she's the most lacking for a reason to actually show up at the academy. That is until she says she plans to see how far Traugott has come. But really that's just an excuse for her to be on guard duty during the tournament. Or more specifically for her, an excuse to avoid memorizing the gods' names for her follow-up ritual. Rosemine tells her divine protections will give her more mana to feed to Stenluke, and she'll grow stronger. That's news to her, now she's actually motivated. Once again, proving the only person able to motivate Angelica is Rosemine. Daniel couldn't come for a few reasons. He's keeping an eye on the Veronica faction as a mana detection specialist, but really he just didn't have an excuse to attend. Hartmut suggested he starts dating one of the students, but Daniel's an idiot who can't pick up on the hint that Felina has a thing for him. Oh well, that conversation is cut short when Sylvester slaps Rosemine on the back of the head to vent some of his frustrations at her. But hey, she's behaving for once, and didn't actually cause any extra problems. I mean, today specifically. Even Rosemine can tell that Sylvester is exhausted, but when she notes that, he rightfully says that she's the source of all of his problems. She offers him a rejuvenation potion, but Ferdinand's tastes like poison, and he refuses the leftover one from the dedication ritual. They have a tournament to attend to, but noticeably, two people who should be there are missing. Karsted and Florencia. Well, Karsted is staying behind because of the purge, and Florencia? Well, she's sick in massive air quotes. The reason comes up later, but for now, she's sitting out and might attend the next day for the graduation. In the meantime, he and Rosemine will team up for socializing while Wilfried and Charlotte handle the lower ranking duchies like they did last year. The reason being Sylvester already anticipates them getting swarmed of visitors. It's to be expected. That's happened for the last few years. In the arena, the Sovereign Knights Order is checking brooches and capes for every noble attending. If something happens after last year and that whole dinner debacle, the king will seriously doubt their capabilities, so they're especially on edge. Except Rosemine is with Sylvester, so they can pretty much breeze through the checks fairly easily. But even inside the event, the knights are on watch, making everyone feel pretty uncomfortable. Likely, this sort of security won't end until either the Workstock Foundation or the Grutra site is found to redraw duchy borders. This is honestly just our confirmation that the Civil War shifted into guerrilla warfare ten years ago and didn't actually end. Even though the losing duchies are fallen, there's still people living there, and they still hold a grudge. At their spot, Charlotte notices that her mom isn't there, but Sylvester tells them not to worry. Just don't screw up, or else she'll feel like she let them down by not coming. Great pep talk. After taking a seat, Cornelius says that Dunkelfelger will for sure be their first visitor. They're actually directly across the stadium. But after enhancing her sight, Rosemine can see that the Aub and his knights are gearing up to race on over, and tugging at his sleeve is Hannah Laura, trying to get him to stand down. But then a woman suddenly approaches and tells him something, which makes him return to the table. That's probably the first wife. Over to Arnsbach, Hartmut notices Ferdinand's cape among the light purple ones. And sure enough, he's rubbing his temples as Raimund explains the Shoemill sound recorder to him. That'll be fun. However, he's not heading to Aaronfest right away. Chances are they'll stop by later, but he and Devlin need to publicize their engagement more this tournament. Well, this should be a good time to give Hysitza back his cape, and Riarda has it on hand. Just then, Raufen announces the tournament start, and off Dunkle Felger goes. But with the first wife taking the lead this time, Sylvester again confirms they're going to negotiate, they stop trying to court Rosemine, and they won't take Hannah Laura. And that was her plan all along, so they're on the same page. And once they arrive, Rosemine greets her and we're officially introduced to Sieglinda, the first wife of Dunkelfelger, and Hannah Laura's mother. 
there's a lot she wants to talk about, especially if you read the Royal Academy stories, from printing, books, and rituals. But the biggest topic's gonna be the Ditter match. She explains that the ref hadn't called the game yet, so Hannah Laura stepping out was their loss. Although she's keeping a noble smile, there's a palpable bite to her words. Aimed at her daughter here? That might seem unfair, and by ours and Rosemine's standards, it is. But there is a reason Sieglinda is pretty harsh on her daughter here. Now we get hints of it in the side story at the end of this volume, but it won't really be fully explained until like, five volumes after this one. But there's cultural, historical, and personal factors at play here, and we'll find out some of those very shortly. So while Hannah Laura shrinks into oblivion over this trash talk, Rosemine steps up to defend her friend by saying it was necessary to keep her safe. And we get a nice distinction between the two duchies' philosophies about knights. In Ehrenfest, knights are there to protect the Archducal family, while Dunkelfelger views their Archducal family as the ones to lead the charge. Through some talking past one another, they come to an agreement of sorts that's not really an agreement. The knights should have protected Hannah Laura, and guarding her as their treasure was their top priority which Sieglinda takes to mean that Ehrenfest views her leaving as acceptable and she shouldn't face blame, right? Right. So she throws out a religious metaphor that Rosemine barely parses, that roughly translates to, as one grows, they find their own place to belong. Basically saying that Hannah Laura yearns for Ehrenfest, but Hannah Laura also knew what she was doing when she made that choice, so clearly she understood the consequences of it. So, wait, is she just agreeing to give her daughter to Ehrenfest? They didn't even get a chance to refuse. Sylvester says, if she'll allow him to be so bold, that Ehrenfest is an upstart duchy, not yet capable of hosting an Archduke candidate from the second. And Sieglinda agrees wholeheartedly. Rosemine is their only value through her industry, trends, knowledge, and leadership skills. Rosemine wants to protest here, but Sylvester gives her a kick under the table to keep her mouth shut. Thus broaches the real issue at hand. If Hannah Laura going to Ehrenfest is set in stone, why take her as a second wife? She would do much better as a first, and from Dunkelfelger's perspective, wives taken from another duchy should be in a public position to leverage their family. Essentially, greater duchies should view their first wives to be exploited externally, while one second or third wife should be taken from within. That way they can handle the internal politics. That makes sense, but spoiler alert, Dunkelfelger didn't even follow that trend themselves. Sieglinda is originally from Dunkelfelger. So they want Hannah Laura to be the first wife, but it's worrisome that Ehrenfest doesn't seem eager to keep climbing the duchy ranks, and is even ignoring common sense by trying to stick Hannah Laura in a position that wouldn't allow her to socialize outside their duchy. But I mean, they did just have that purge, so shaking things up anymore could destabilize the whole duchy itself. Sylvester is adamant that Hannah Laura couldn't be their first wife. He's not gonna budge. And that's when Sieglinda puts the nail in the coffin, by saying that she does actually love her daughter and wouldn't want her to end up like a certain Arnsbach romantic in the past. So I know some people were wondering why the hell that Gabrielle shit was so prevalent in part 4. Well, here's your answer. It not only informed Ehrenfest's political situation internally, but externally as well. That one incident essentially set the tone for Ehrenfest for the last 60 years. She explains that it takes decades for a noble population to adjust to the way a top-ranking duchy operates. And how exactly has Ehrenfest changed since welcoming Gabrielle of Arnsbach? Poorly. Remember, Ehrenfest wasn't even ranked number 13 back then. They were a true blue, bottom-ranking duchy, accepting an Archduke candidate from not just a greater, but a much higher-ranked duchy than them. We already know that Arnsbach has fallen in the ranking since the purge due to their mana shortage. Any other Archduke probably would have taken that as a huge boon for their duchy, made her the first wife of his son, and exploited their new asset. But Ehrenfest didn't. As Sieglinda keenly notes, Ehrenfest hasn't changed internally since Rosemine appeared. So as the conversation proceeds, with Rosemine only getting about half of it due to the noble language being used, it becomes clear that Dunkelfelger isn't just talking about Anna Laura. They still want Rosemine to marry into their duchy despite losing their dinner match, essentially saying she's too big for a backwater like them to handle. And her marrying in will allow Dunkelfelger to protect not just Anna Laura, but Ehrenfest in turn. This is how other duchies view Ehrenfest, as backwards and ungrateful. So rather than repeat the mistakes of the past, Sieglinda looks to have her own insurance by having Rosemine marry into their duchy, while also exploiting her in the process. Yeah, she's had enough. Rosemine asks for Sylvester's permission to handle this, and he finally relents. This is when Rosemine goes ham and throws Dunkelfelger a curveball, leaving Sieglinda speechless. She asks her point blank why they're going against the terms agreed upon in their game, and to be silent like losers should be. And Alora is even stunned. 
but she presses the attack, saying to quit talking about what's good for each other when the people involved are right here. That clears the air somewhat, and Sieglinda asks why they requested Hannah Laura then. Wasn't it because they wanted her as an asset? And the answer is no. They always wanted to cancel the terms. She discussed that with Hannah Laura. This was all just a bluff to get Lestalot to back down and quit challenging them to dinner. So Sylvester gift wraps this by asking her to accept their request and help her daughter out of this bind. But then she asks in turn, what if Hannah Laura actually wishes to marry into Aaronfest? Will they still make her a second wife? Well, they don't really see that happening, but Anna Laura finally speaks up. She says she doesn't want to trouble Aaronfest as they agreed upon. They're not ready to accept an Archduke candidate from a greater duchy. When she looks over at Wilfried, she adds that she wished to marry into Aaronfest when he saved her, but if they're not ready, don't push it. That's only going to cause problems. <laughs> Looks like they're finally in agreement then. Sieglinda doesn't want her daughter to marry him because of what happened to Gabrielle. Aaronfest doesn't want another Gabrielle. And Anna Laura doesn't want to trouble them by imposing. Win-win. Well, not entirely. While on the same page, finally, there are some misunderstandings they need to address. Specifically, while Rosemine says the terms of their game were for Dunkelfelger to not pressure her about ending her engagement anymore, the contract states otherwise. I'm sorry, contract? Sieglinda produces a contract signed by Wilfried and Lestalot, or rather a budget request? It's kinda complicated. Either way, it's not in there, so when did Hannah Laura and Rosemine plan this? They talked about it with sound blockers while Wilfried and Lestalot were drafting this up, but it's clearly a budget form. Those are common enough in the Academy that they've seen them, but it's explained that in Dunkelfelger, contracts are a necessary part of Bride taking Ditter, so terms can't be changed after the match, exactly like they tried to do by informing Wilfried and Lestalot at dinner rather than when they were being signed. But this is weird. How did Wilfried not realize he was signing a contract? I mean, the kid's stupid, but he's not that stupid, right? But here's the kicker. Dunkelfelker never actually agreed to stop pursuing Rosemine because they opted for Hannah Laura to be their second wife as the prize instead. Because she proposed that, it was assumed that Aaronfest prioritized Hannah Laura over Rosemine's engagement. Hence why Sieglinda had been so adamant about negotiating Hannah Laura as being their first wife, while proposing to still take Rosemine off their hands, as she had assumed that's what would make both parties happy. Again, I touched on this in my last video, but they all thought this was bride taking dinner, not bride stealing. And the thought there is, is that the bride is willing to leave, but the husband isn't letting her go. So the match was assumed to have been between Wilfried and Lestalot, not Lestalot and Rosemine. Well, this is sort of awkward. Rosemine was just super rude to Hannah Laura's mom when she didn't even have the facts right. So she and Sylvester apologize, but Sieglinda apologizes back. Since Aaronfest isn't familiar with this form of ditter, so they didn't really understand what was happening. Lestalot failed to explain it, on purpose, mind you. And also, Hannah Laura's job is to be the voice of reason when men in their duchy get so riled up over Ditter. So then Sieglinda asks, what does Aaronfest really want from their victory? And Sylvester answers that they want them to let Rosemine's engagement stand. Also, it would be super cool if they would stop challenging them to Ditter every year. It's getting draining. Well, Sieglinda can agree to those terms. Let's suggest they stop accepting those Ditter invites in the first place. Because in doing so, it's made everyone in their dorm assume that Aaronfest loves Ditter like they do. Hell, that's even in Ralphin's reports. Rosemine agrees with Sylvester's sentiment, and then Sieglinda asks Hannah Laura if she knows anything Aaronfest might want for their years of trouble. And she does have an idea here. Rosemine wanted Lestalot's drawings for their book. How about he sacrifices something for once? Yeah, that sounds like a great idea to all the women in this conversation. And with that, we can finally put Ditter behind us. For like five more volumes. Look, I need a break. So the next topic is printing. Sieglinda expresses Dunkelfelger's interest in purchasing the magic tools involved, but Rosemine declines. She was already aware of that from Lestalot's reports, but this is somewhat backwards. Usually this sort of stuff spreads when the inventor sells to the top-ranking duchies who then popularize it. But Rosemine wants Aaronfest to acclimate to her ideas before selling it to other duchies. That'll lay the groundwork. They'll have to settle for printing manuscripts for them instead. That inevitably leads to them discussing Farinestein, where Sieglinda brings up the rumors of how it's based on Rosemine and she's abused in Aaronfest. But Sylvester's holding back a laugh. He knows who it's actually based on. And they clear the air around her treatment. Hannah Laura, though, is definitely looking forward to the conclusion. However, Rosemine has to be the bearer of bad news. It's a three-volume story, and she only has the second one done. But just as that discussion starts to wrap up, Harnsbach enters the chat. Sylvester struggles to not burst up laughing since Fernestein himself just appeared, but Rosemine notices how sick he looks. 
yeah, clearly he's living off rejuvenation potions again. But that Lind really leans into her more annoying tendencies this conversation. Because despite being at Arnfest's spot, she's talking to Hannah Laura and Sieglinda about research. Yeah, sure, their research at Arnfest is interesting, but hey, did you hear about hers? Sieglinda tries her best to handle this, but it's really no use. That Lind hears only what she wants to hear. Ferdinand is really struggling to keep his smile up, and as soon as he sees Rosemine, he pinches her cheeks really hard. He has a ton to say to her, but this isn't the place. The reason they came is because Dunkelfelger is there, so Ferdinand asks for his cape and turns to Heisitza. The legend appears and is super thrilled to be talking to Ferdinand again. I mean, he's the one who rallied to get him out of the temple after all. But Ferdinand puts on his best smile, saying how the emotions he's feeling cannot be put into words that he's marrying Det Lind, Veronica's granddaughter. It was that exact moment he knew he fucked up. Heisitza knows Ferdinand's past well enough to recognize he did the most unnecessary thing in the world and ruined Ferdinand's joy in the process. So Ferdinand places the cape in Heisitza's hand, saying that he's marrying Det Lind. He can't go around playing Ditter whenever he wants anymore and he can't wait forever for Heisitza to win it back, so he's returning it right now. The knights all celebrate, but Heisitza's just sort of frozen there. Ferdinand then tells him to be as excited as he was for his engagement. That snaps him out of it. He puts on a fake smile, but he knows this isn't how he was meant to regain his cape. There's no honor in this. Detlin then inserts herself into this conversation to hear the story of how Ferdinand got Heisitz's cape. But she doesn't really see this as a valiant struggle like the Dunkelfelger knights are painting it out to be. She just sees Ferdinand as a villain stealing a cape embroidered by Heisitz's then fiancé. But good news. She's distracted. Ferdinand takes a seat and has a refreshing cup of his favorite tea served by Brunhilde. They apparently don't have his preferred Brandon Arnsbach, so this is like a breath of fresh air to him. He remarks about their joint research with Dunkelfelger and says he's surprised that such an old ritual remains alive and well in their duchy. That's confusing. Ralphin actually taught when Ferdinand was in the academy, so we know that much. How did he not learn it? But back then, he wasn't the main instructor of the Knights course. Anna Laura explains he only revived it after a different professor retired, and he was put in charge of the whole thing. And this ritual here has a lot of appeal. The students have about an 80% success rate, while the Dunkelfelger adults have refined it quite a bit. But knights from other duchies also wish to learn so they can hunt Fabies more efficiently. This renewed interest has resulted in a hell of a lot more ditter, and Ob Dunkelfelger leading the knights into the temple to touch the divine instruments to make their own. Yeah, Rosemine definitely caused that. Sieglinda says she almost resented her for it, and that piques Ferdinand's interest. What did she do to earn that ire? Well, Hannah Laura explained she didn't do anything at all. She just mimicked Dunkelfelger's ritual with Leidenschaft's spear, and that caused a blessing that kickstarted this whole thing. Yeah, she didn't include that detail in her letters. As he's staring daggers at her, Hannah Laura backs up the bus she just drove over Rosemine with, and adds how overjoyed the Zent was after having participated in the dedication ritual with her. Yeah, she's doomed. Somebody's gonna have to save her before too much information gets leaked. And Det Lind, of all people, steps in to be that unlikely hero. Don't be fooled. She's not actually saving the day. So she inserts herself into this research talk to, again, brag about their own research. Massive air quotes there. By regurgitating what Rosemine and Rymoon had wrote as though it were her own ideas while obfuscating Aaronfest's involvement. Sieglinda turns to Rosemine, at a loss, but really getting through to Det Lind is like talking sense into a brick wall. But Rosemine explains to go see it for themselves, as it'll become clear that it is joint research, even if Det Lind won't acknowledge it. Cute shoe mills are a symbol of Aaronfest after all. Speaking of, the brat asks Ferdinand to get her that shoe mill, but it's Rosemine's, and hell, she already has plans for it, giving it to Letizia. But Det Lind won't take the hint. Like, it's very clear that everyone in this conversation is talking down to her, and she just keeps talking about how she's gonna be the next Ob, so give her what she wants. Lisa Letta steps in to say she can make another without issue, so Rosemine steps up and offers the one that's already been made to Det Lind. That'll make her happy. Ferdinand is clearly upset that she got her way, but the conversation doesn't stop. That shoe mill may become Aaronfest's next trend, but hairpins are still the current one. Will Det Lind be wearing one? Oh, you bet your ass. And she happily explains how she'll look the part of the next op. But just then, a pissed off ordinance from Frau Larm lands right in front of Rosemine and demands to know what sort of trickery this is. Sounds like they finally got to the end of the recordings, and her advertisement went live. After Lisa Letta explains that's probably what happened, Det Lind races out as Harnsbach's joint research that they were propping up as their own just advertised Aaronfest goods. 
As Ferdinand goes to follow, he comments how unpredictable Rosemine is, and pats her on the head with a very good for good measure. Hey, he said the thing. Anyway, why Ferdinand is disgusted that Detlind weaseled her way into getting that toy is explained later this book, but based on what we know about her family, we can kind of make an educated guess. After he leaves, Anna Laura remarks how pleased Rosemine looks, and of course she is. She got the much sought after very good. He only ever gives that out when she's made everyone pass their classes on the first day without letting their grades drop. Everyone there is stunned because, goddamn, is he a harsh teacher? But it's not abuse. She swears. He even gave her books after finishing the really hard tasks. Right? Sylvester finally points out that all the books that Ferdinand was giving her were literally on her next lesson. Yeah, that actually happened in part four. Remember? Well, no time to dwell on that. Anastasius is their next big visitor they get, and when Dunkel Felger goes to leave, he tells them to stay put too. He needs to speak with them as well. He puts down an area sound blocker and requires all uninvolved parties to step out so they can speak openly here. Also has Rosemine throw up shoots Arya's shield for good measure. And his first lobbied complaint is at the Guardians. Because Hannah, Laura, and Rosemine were the center of a ton of headaches this year, he damn near summoned them to the Academy to talk this over, but he waited very patiently until the Inner Duchy Tournament. But this is all just about that whole Ditter thing, right? You can't really blame Rosemine and Hannah Laura for that. Sylvester tells her not to argue with royalty, but she says they need to state their case. Hell, Anastasia should know the value of speaking plainly since that's how he won over Eglantine. And that's basically why he put the sound blocker down in the first place, isn't it? So she explains they never really wanted to play Ditter, they just kept getting dragged into it, all the way back in her first year even. That was Ralphin's idea. So after all this time, Anastasius finally suggests that she just refuse. And hey, she's already cleared that with Sieglinda, so they're on the same page. But she does add that maybe the royals or professor should at least look into why Ditter is being played more often, especially for the lower ranked duchies so they don't get bullied by the upper ranked ones. Sylvester backs that up because it would save them a lot of headaches, and Anastasia says he'll consider it. That brings him squarely to the knights who attacked during the Ditter game, and while Hildebrand mentioned it around the knights, it was never actually in order. They can't figure out why the knights acted that way, and Rosemine looks over to Sylvester before asking Anastasius if he's ever heard of a drug called Trug. Sylvester tries to stop her, but it's too late. And she even explains that if the Sovereign Knight's order is compromised, Dunkelfelger is their safest bet for keeping the country safe. So I want to point out, it's not wrong, but it's also not Rosemine's place to be saying that right now. It puts Ehrenfest in a pretty bad spot. I mean, we just got done talking about their political situation ad nauseum, so she's honestly lucky she built such a strong rapport with Anastasius and Hannah Laura beforehand. Again, the groundwork from her first year in the Academy is really coming back. Anastasius asks Sieglinda if she knows what that is, and as it turns out, Dunkel Felger doesn't, so Sylvester has to man up and do the explaining. Since he's not just the most knowledgeable, he understands what can actually be told to the royal family. So he explains the effects, its sweet aroma when it's burned, and why they believe it was used on the knights. Anastasius wants more details, obviously, but there's really not much to give. They only found out about it at the start of winter when they uncovered the plot and saw the after effects of looking at these traders' memories. The scholar who identified this drug is in his 50s and was taught by a herbology professor who retired before the student even graduated, meaning this stuff is from decades ago and likely hasn't been taught ever since. They don't even know where it grows. It's likely only ever found in one duchy and rarely leaves it, for obvious reasons. So Anastasius asks the obvious question, where were the traders connected to? And Sylvester gives him the answer. They were connected to his older sister, the first wife of Arensbach. So let's review. We know Trug is connected to Georgine and Arensbach, it's not widely known about. And extrapolating a little bit, we know Arensbach has a very key trading partner. The origins of this become a lot more concrete, especially as we learn how it came into the Sovereign Knight's possession. But hey, the audience can draw a conclusion here where the characters cannot. With that, Anastasius concludes by saying that Ehrenfest's contributions have been innumerable at this point. You know, with that whole mana from the ritual, the massive research endeavors, and just how they've inadvertently helped the sovereignty and the king as a result. So he tells them. With this, they can reach an even higher rank next year. But what does Ehrenfest actually think of that? Sylvester contemplates it for a bit, and finally asks that they don't raise their rank. It's becoming painfully obvious to them that they aren't acting their rank right now, and they need time to adjust. Instead, he would like their contributions to make up for not lending their aid during the Civil War. Basically treat Ehrenfest as a winning duchy rather than a neutral one. 
and Anastasius sees that as a pretty wise suggestion, and will pass it on to his father. So treating them like a winning duchy sounds great on paper, until you realize it's going to cause more friction than you can even fathom. Because what the sovereignty considers kind consideration turns out to be a pretty hefty demand for a middle duchy with a low population coming out of a purge. I've already talked in my previous videos how the sovereignty doesn't really know how to handle lower and middle duchies because they're so focused on the greater ones. And this is going to be the biggest impact of that moving forward. To wrap this up, Anastasius has one last request for the two guardians present. The royal family wants Hannah, Laura, and Rosemine to visit the underground archive every day during the Archduke Conference. That seems counterintuitive considering how much they suspected her of treason, but Anastasius says that her actions this year pretty much put that to rest. They don't suspect her or Ferdinand for plotting a rebellion now. Well, that's nice. Rosemine's just excited to get back in there, but Sylvester apologizes for the trouble that she's caused them. He then says through a bunch of euphemisms that Ferdinand was the one holding her leash. And Anastasius now understands that fully. However, Ferdinand is now far too useful in propping up Arnsbach. They can't just send him back to Arnfest. No matter what, they can't let the only duchy with an open country gate fall to ruin. But why is that? Is there an issue with Lanzanov? You could say that. Ferdinand had mentioned them trying to send an Adelgisa princess. Anastasius mentions that there may be a conflict with them. So, that's probably the cause of it. At least that's as far as we know right now. But she plainly states that if anything were to happen to Ferdinand, she'll go save him no matter what. And Sylvester and Anastasius both tell her not to get involved, as that would just make things worse. We call that foreshadowing. This meeting went pretty well. Anastasius calls it there, but leaves with one last warning. The Sovereign Temple said that knights being up on stage during a ceremony is blasphemy, but they can still bring blue priests and shrine maidens instead. That shouldn't be a problem for Aaronfest, right? Where even their Archduke candidates wear blue robes? Message received. Our knights have to wear blue robes. Hell, Daniel, Angelica, and Cornelius were already doing that. With that, Dunkelfelger and the royal family take their leave, only to be replaced by Klausenberg. Rosemine greets the awe band. He's already pretty interested in doing research next year. Sylvester pawns that off on Rosemine since it's in the realm of students to do research, and she doesn't really want to be bothered with it. The thing is, they want to turn this dedication ritual into a yearly event. Rosemine's not liking that because, well, it was a bitch and a half to put together. If Klausenberg wants to do it, they can be the ones to provide their shit. Yeah, they're not backing down on it either. So how Klausenberg changes the topic to trade. He's interested in the hand pumps after hearing about them from his merchants. And that's a bit of a complicated issue. It's handled through the smithing guild with essentially a copyright, so the invention itself can't really be sold wholesale. On top of that, the parts take quite a bit of skill to make. Hartmut steps forward to explain that, and even adds that greater duchies might not want to watch their commoners as closely, because Klausenberg has already tried to pull some crap over on him. And you know, he's not wrong. Sylvester says they'll need to iron out the details first so they can discuss it at the Archduke Conference. Way back in Rosemine's first year, if you'll recall an Eglantine side story, Glossenberg wanted to make a connection with her, but ultimately failed. As we know, they took some comfort at the time, believing they were the furthest along in that race. But even though they're the first-ranked duchy, they're ultimately an afterthought in her mind, because she knows so fewer people from that one compared to the other greater duchies. And honestly, this is probably more of a comment about her views on status in the first place. The first rank duchy doesn't mean shit to her. And I mean, you might kind of feel bad for them, but I don't. Klausenberg are kind of stuck up jerks. And after talking to pretty much every duchy higher rank than them about trade slots, it's finally time for lunch. So they head back to the dorm where they talk about what happened on the way, where we get some more info that Sylvester doesn't really have a ton of info on the hand pumps, because the scholars he put in charge of that were all let go due to the purge. Anyway, uh... They should probably be focusing on Groschel's renovation next. That's actually going to increase their trade slots. So if they do it this spring, could they actually get more business slots then? Well, no, because it's going to take them time to get it all furnished. And that's even after it's clean. But when they see Wilfried, they both lay into him about the contract he signed like an idiot. But as it turns out, it wasn't entirely his fault. Lest a lot misled him. Hell, it was even on plant paper. And per the agreement with the Parchment Guild way back in part one, Contracts can't be put on plant paper. That was actually a key part of negotiations when selling plant paper to other duchies. Well, damn, 
Turns out Wilfried isn't a complete idiot after all. Lestalot made a mistake. They informed Dunkelfelger to be careful in the future with plant paper. And Hannah Laura replies back with a thank you for informing them. And in the background of that ordinance, you can hear Sieglinda yelling at Lestalot for wasting all their parchment on illustrations. So I can't really stress enough, every little detail you saw in part 1 and 2 do eventually come back at some point in the story. Some of them really do wait until part 5. So that whole thing with the Parchment Guild not allowing contracts to be on plant paper actually comes back years later to save their asses from a troublesome contract. They may have been on the same page leaving that meeting, but it was still in ink. This just invalidated the previous agreement they both wanted torn to shreds anyway. So how was their research received? Turns out well. Gundalf stopped by to see Aaronfest's presentation on their Druanchal stuff and was blown away with the results. He never expected that something like this could be made with such low mana requirements, combining their Arnsbach research and taking the same idea in a completely different direction. He was thoroughly impressed and commended their growth for keeping this a secret from him. Apparently that's a standard practice, and they proved themselves here. Next, he was very interested in Arnfest's graphs on their Dunkelfelger research, to the point that he initially disregarded the research itself, and focused entirely on how it was presented. Now this isn't complex stuff, but literally nobody has thought to visualize numbers like this before. Roderick got stuck explaining that, while Felina explained the research itself, until more and more professors and sovereign scholars gathered, and it was like they were teaching a class themselves. So definitely a big hit, and Juanchal is going to use graphs next year. Also, as expected, they want to work with her. We learned that Dunkelfelger is actually going to do a demonstration at the end of Ditter this year, that way they can showcase how the ritual is done. Luarati was so enraptured by the Shumil speaking lines from the Royal Academy love stories that she was the one who made it to the last message. Yeah, she triggered Frau Larm and earned a very good from Rosemine herself. With lunch done, it's time to get back to socializing. The afternoon is when the lower ranked duchies move and the upper ranks play Ditter. So that's why the lower ranks play Ditter in the morning, as we learned last year. Because the students are supposed to be hosting, and then they can step out to go see their duchy play Ditter. But Leonor asks for a blessing for their match this year and gets turned down. They can't keep relying on Rosemine forever. And after that Ditter match last book, that rings more true than ever. Cornelius is shocked that she's not giving them a blessing, but she goes on to tell him, Dunkel Felger is going to demonstrate the ritual and dance. People are starting to take religious ceremonies more seriously now. If she keeps blessing their students, they won't learn how to obtain their own through rituals, thus stunting their growth. And they already know that impacts their divine protection, so this will hurt them not just in the short term, but the long term as well. Blessings really do play a big role this part so they're already seeing themselves at a disadvantage because they rely on her so much. That much was made clear during the Ditter game, where she had to be the one firing off blessings because the students couldn't get them. On the way to the arena, Rosemine asks Sylvester if they're going to go visit other duchies, and he looks at her like she's crazy. The whole point is to visit those you're on good terms with, or want to get closer to. Literally, the only duchies at their spots right now are the very same upper-ranked duchies they just saw that morning. Meaning, did she want to reopen trade discussions? What is she, stupid? On top of that, they just got scolded by Anastasius to act more like their rank. So they can't really go socializing when the bottom ranked duchies are doing so, can they? Instead, he tells her to go watch some dinner and relax, before they get more visitors than they can handle. Though this is probably just him trying to get her to avoid the lower ranked duchies, assuming they're probably pretty pissed off at her from the dedication ritual. So first up for dinner is Arnsbach. The professors are all pretty pumped after what Frau Larm pulled last year, and they want to put the upper ranked duchies to the test with more exotic Fabies. That actually works in Aaronfest's favor, because they've been studying that for a few years now. But the kicker here? Herscher's the one summoning their Fey Beast, and decides to get a little even for last year, so she summons a Talfrosh. And Rosemine is grossed out immediately, remembering when she was eaten by one with Bridget. Though they're not as bad as the Hunter Teal Lung from last year, it does pose a decent enough challenge that Arnsbach stumbles in taking it down. And while they're doing that, Lisa Letta calls Rosemine back because Frembeltag's Archducal couple is there to socialize. Oh, also Hartmut left to go talk with Clarissa's parents, and apparently they're at a loss after realizing Rosemine was her main interest, not Hartmut himself. So, here she is. We're finally introduced to Sylvester's other older sister, the one who's actually nice, Constance. First impression, Rosemine kind of already knows her personality, since she was featured pretty heavily in Sylvester and Florencia's story in the Royal Academy stories. But for us, know that she gives off similar vibes to Sylvester rather than Detlinder Georgine. So pretty good. 
As for Ob Frembeltag, he looks a lot like Charlotte, which is pretty crazy. But the first thing they bring up is how sad it is that Rudiger and Rosemine didn't get to talk that much. Apparently he's taken a pretty big interest in the temple, and is working his ass off with other members of their Archducal family to fill the void. Honestly, they would like to do joint research next year on religious ceremonies as well, possibly comparing crop yields with and without Archducal family help. But Constance notices that Florencia is absent, and that's when Sylvester finally lets us know what's up. She's pregnant again. So you may recall during their visit in Volume 1 of this part that Florencia wasn't looking that good. In the last book, she fainted from reading Rosemine's reports and needed to see a doctor. Turns out it was morning sickness, and it really couldn't have come at a worse time. Remember Sylvester's supposed to be looking for a second or third wife at the Archduke conference this year? That puts that on the back burner. Rosemine is pumped for another baby brother or sister, but Sylvester tells her to can it because nobles don't usually talk about this crap. Worst case scenario, there's a miscarriage, and second worst is, they don't actually have the mana to fit their status and are sent to the temple. But for her, all she's thinking about is making a black and white picture book like she wanted to for Camille. Constance isn't super thrilled here because, well, she actually cares about her brother and knows that he's living a fantasy. Duchies with smaller archducal families are just that much more vulnerable, and this is Aaronfest's second generation in a row where they haven't had a second or third wife to bolster their number. But Aub Frembeltag is honestly just happy to see that Sylvester still treasures his sister, despite her home duchy falling in the rankings so much after the Civil War. I mean, hell, Aaronfest is even going up. Usually she would have been dumped a second or third wife. But getting back to religious ceremonies, it turns out that Constance was the one who accepted Rudiger's push to go to the temple and help. So Aaronfest must be pretty unique in that regard. As for their proposal on research, well, Rosemine won't be in the academy next year the whole term, so Charlotte and Wilfried will probably have to head that one up. And with that, they leave to go discuss it with those two. After they're gone, Rosemine points out how they waited until the royals changed public perception to propose this research that's very unique to their duchy. It's clear they may be bottom rank now, but Frembeltag definitely used to be a top ranking duchy, and Sylvester says that once their mana shortage is over, they'll climb again in no time. The current ob is pretty smart. So we don't really know Frembeltag's actual rank before the story took place, but we can assume it was pretty high. I mean, think about it. Florencia is the daughter of a third wife, and she was going to marry in as the first wife of a future ob? And that was considered a point of contention. So really that tells you just how good the world building here is, because that's all context and not actually plain text. Okay, back to Ditter then, because Heronfest is next. Gundolf is their summoner for this match, and that seems easy enough, right? I mean, at least he's not for alarm. But no, they warn her that he knows a ton about Fabies, and he's also taken quite the interest in Fae plants after this research. Yeah, that lit a big fire under his ass. So he summons... a tree? Wait, can he do that? Apparently so. But this just looks like a normal sort of tree. Rosemine doesn't recognize it, but Leonore does, and starts barking out orders to form an attack strategy which everyone jumps to. Turns out, this is a gum cup. The rubber tree Ferdinand told mine about way back in part two. Yes, literally everything comes back around at some point. The plan here is to strike with a massive mana blast, which causes it to attack in turn by shooting out thorny tendrils that have toxin on them. It can make your limbs go numb, apparently. The knights have to cut away those branches and repeat the process until there's none left. Now, if you'll recall, Rosemine wants the bark, but this is a summon fey plant. It's made from Gundolf's mana, so it won't stick around after being defeated. And as the process goes on, Ironfest knights do beat the Gumka pretty easily, with Traugott and Alexis delivering the final blows and securing their victory. The knights come back to Ironfest's spot, and Sylvester gives them a very earned well done. It might seem like Leonore was the star here, calling out all the shots and such, but that's just because she was in a leadership position. Other apprentices recognize the Gumka as well, not just her. She prepared notes on everything she studied over the past few years, and it's all in the bookcase back in the dorm. That way they can pass down this knowledge to younger generations, so this type of competitive edge won't be lost. The representative of the Knight's Order, because Karstad isn't there, then step up to say how well they all work together. They could easily join a trombe hunt right after graduation, and have no problems integrating. So, that's definitely a mark of pride. Especially considering how bad off they were just a few years ago. Matthias is actually the next most strategically minded knight, so in terms of taking over at the academy, he's next in line even though he's a med noble, so that's a pretty big responsibility. So Sylvester takes Wilfrey back to go socialize, while Rosemine and Charlotte get to watch more Ditter. 
The reason being they need to get Wilfried more comfortable socializing so he can deal with proposals for Charlotte. Why is this important? Well, as has been a theme and one even noticed by top ranking duchies, Ehrenfest going up in the ranks is purely off of Rosemine, so their position's anything but stable. It won't be until their internal politics is settled down and nobles adopt the perspective of a top ranking duchy, and this impacts who Charlotte will get to marry. They're not sure which duchies they'll be able to wrangle yet, so it's kind of important. While the Civil War may have left Ehrenfest mostly unchanged, this purge will be a massive transforming force internally. Rosemine wants to use it to turn Ehrenfest into an actual top-ranking duchy through and through, by reforming a lot of the perspectives nobles have. So with that, they go back to watch the rest of Ditter. Trow got failed Angelica's test, so I guess she said on Bonifatius. Which really means she said on no one. With the end of Ditter, it's time for Dunkelfelger to demonstrate the ritual. Who's taking charge of this endeavor? The Ob himself. And in his hand is Leidenschaft's spear that he clearly borrowed from his temple for this demonstration. He explains the history, how most don't know it because they weren't trained by Raufen, and how much they practice to not need rejuvenation potions, because they can give the perfect amount of mana to give a blessing. That's important to show it's viable. Also, they're accustomed to the blessing itself after training to not lose control like the Aaronfest Apprentice Knights did when they first got theirs. But him showing the actual divine instrument makes a ton of nobles gasp, because they had never realized they could actually be used like this before. When they do the actual ritual and cause a pillar of light, that's when a lot of nobles realize the power of this ritual. Even Sylvester is impressed, having joined the children to watch. But this also explains the whole rumors around Rosemine causing these sort of pillars. You know, that whole being an avatar of a goddess thing. But after beating some Fabies, Anna Laura does the cooling ritual and that's the end of it. It's officially time for the award ceremony now. Wilfrey and Charlotte head down first so Rosemine can rest as much as possible before her lecture by Ferdinand tonight. I mean, how bad can this actually be? Yeah, it's her first award ceremony, but it is her third year coming first in class. However, when Sylvester says Ferdinand probably doesn't know the full extent of her rampages so far because she only wrote what would get past inspections, she stays silent. Yeah, he didn't really account for that whole invisible letter passing thing where inspections mean jack shit. Oh well, she's doomed. He gives her one last piece of advice. Just say how great of an honor it is to be praised by the king when he does so. Rosemine takes off and joins her duchy students right before the king arrives. She didn't realize it before, but pretty much the whole royal family was there for the dedication ritual, telling you how low on people they are. It was only the king's wives who didn't attend, and she even notes how much healthier the king looks after the dedication ritual. The sovereign knight steps forward to announce the Ditter rankings. First and second were Dunkelfelger and Klausenberg respectively, pretty obvious considering their track record and ranks, but third place was actually Ehrenfest. That sends a stir through the audience. Even a few duchies start whispering how Gundalf summoned a favorable fey beast for them, but they can't respond to that. These are coming from duchies ranked higher than themselves. But then again, there's no need. Other duchies spoke up in their defense. Professors don't know who they're gonna summon for until the very start of the tournament, and Ehrenfest fought a strong fey beast and did well. At least some people get it. Alexis and Leonor step forward as the representatives, and Raubloop gives a pretty standard message about their future prospects of joining the Sovereign Knights Order but they're under no illusion. This is in large part due to Bonifatius and Karstedt's increased training of the Apprentice Knights and their own hard work. They have much to be proud of. Next is the Research Awards. Narenfest takes both first and third place with their Dunkelfelger and Arnsbach joint research? Okay. The Dunkelfelger one we expected, I mean, the royal family participated in that, but Arnsbach? Pretty sure that was just some pretty ordinary stuff. But no. There's a clear theme here. It's about increasing mana or reducing mana costs, telling you just how bad the mana shortage has impacted the country. She joins Lestalot for the first award, and while she's surprised, he isn't at all. But he starts to say something to her when Det Lind, of course, interrupts to accept on Arnsbach's behalf. Pretty shameless. Also, she's been interrupting a lot of people lately. So what was Lestalot gonna say here? It's kinda hard to tell. A lot of last book was about his fight for her, but... Does he actually love her? Probably not. Love was a pretty convenient excuse at the time, and he's coming off a massive lecture from his mother. As a noble, he's really good at coming up with practical reasons for his actions, and there's a lot of practicality in wanting Rosemine for Dunkelfelger. But at the same time, if we look at his way of speaking to her in his third year, there's been a definite shift. So here, I think he was mostly looking to reconcile before he got interrupted. The last award to be given out is for hosting, and it goes in order of rank. Wait, why is that? Ehrenfest did pretty well this year. 
right? Well, yeah, they did, but there's a pretty big element Rosemine's not accounting for. They lack the people to actually host everyone, so they have to turn guests away. Yeah, this is pretty dependent on duchy population and how many attendants you have. So that's going to be her next project, increasing Aaronfest population. With that, it's time to announce the honor students. Leonore, Alexis, Brunhilda, Natalie, Matthias, Lorenz, Ignaz, and of course Wilfried. With Rosemine being first in class for the third years, this is Brunhilda's first time being an honor student, and a lot of that has to do with Rosemine not collapsing during class or tea parties. On top of that, Matthias seems a bit conflicted, but she tells him that she couldn't be more proud of him. He's so stunned, he kneels. He then takes her hand and places the back of it to his forehead. Yup, there's that profoundly symbolic gesture again. While that gets her flustered, why is he doing this all of a sudden? Well, think about it. He wouldn't be there without her, and his father pretty much just expected him to be an honor student, so her praise here is pretty important to him. As Rosemine takes the stage, people start to talk. Why? Well, because most have never actually seen her. This is the famed Fest girl who hasn't shown up for the past two years despite her grades, and got the royals to attend the dedication ritual. Yeah, talk about nerves. So when she goes up to get praise from the king directly, he talks about her high grades for the past three years, and her joint research. Her efforts will go on to help the whole country. Wow, when he puts it like that, most people only ever complain about her rampages, so she's pretty moved to get some genuine praise for her efforts. She says it's an honor and the whole arena claps, Sylvester and Ferdinand included. Well, that gets her pumped for next year. I mean, what could actually top this year? We'll find out, but let's just say it'll blow your expectations. That's crazy considering how much the third year built those up. Alright, time for dinner with Ferdinand. When the bell rings for the tea party room, Sylvester's attendants let Ferdinand in. Rosemine welcomes him home and he's feeling a bit awkward, but eventually says it's good to be back. He introduces Wilfried and Rosemine to Sergius, who we learn is actually Letizia's head attendant's son. So he's originally from Juanchal, and for sure not a part of Georgine's faction. That's a relief. So with the greetings out of the way, Sylvester takes his leave and allows Rosemine and Wilfried to have dinner with Ferdinand. She starts by saying she accomplished the task he gave her at the start of the year, and that does very little to dissuade him from lecturing her, even if Sylvester told him to go easy on her, and she feels she should get at least some praise first. And after an extremely monotone, very good, he finally apologizes for what Detlin did, taking that shoe mill away. Yeah, it turns out that was really bugging him, but it's not his fault. They give him the grand tour where he finally sees the finished bench. He's impressed it was finished already, and Rosemine even notes that he should be able to rest pretty well on it. This is the first time in a long time he's looked openly exhausted. Wilfried can't really tell the difference, but Rosemine can, and he turns that back around on her, because he can tell that she's starting to get a fever. She'll need to take a rejuvenation potion and rest up tonight. He goes through the usual inspection, checking her pulse and temperature, which she doesn't bat an eye at. Oswald and Wilfried not so much, as we'll see in a side story later this volume. Though Wilfried is pretty oblivious to the implications of that physical contact, it does still throw him off. So they get to dinner, where Sergius serves Ferdinand, while Eustace checks the refilled time-stopping magic tool to ensure that Ferdinand has meals ready. They're pretty happy to receive it since they were running low on Aaronfest food, but the food they're eating that night stands out. It's not the stuff that's usually served in the dorm, hell, some of it's kinda rare. As it turns out, the castle chefs were super busy, but Rosemine reached out to Ferdinand's former temple chefs to prepare him a special meal. It's all of his old favorites. They talk about the inner duchy tournament and how popular Aaronfest was this year. They report that Sylvester asked for their rank to not be raised, but instead to be treated as a winning duchy, which is honestly a pretty good move. But that does mean she went overboard again, so Wilfried says that Ferdinand should scold her extra hard for all this trouble, but instead he turns his critical gaze to Wilfried, because it's his job to keep her in line as her future husband. Hell, he literally entrusted Rosemine to him at the end of last part. After dinner, they have some tea, where Sergius takes his leave to eat, giving them a little bit more privacy, but not entirely. As Ferdinand indirectly asks about how the purge went, and Rosemine starts to tell him, but Wilfried actually stops her, and both he and Ferdinand remind her that he's not from Aaronfest anymore, and to not openly discuss their internal affairs. So I should probably point out, this is less Ferdinand can't know, and more Sergius is just on the other side of a thin screen wall. He can hear everything. Though Rosemine does need to be conscious of what information she just blurts out in the future too. But this does bring up how Ferdinand will repay Rosemine for the shoe mill Detlin stole. And as it turns out, it was for Letizia. Lisa Letta gets her to accept Ferdinand's apology because, well, this is really about him enjoying himself. The table is cleared, and an impromptu brewing session takes place 
where Ferdinand instructs the apprentice scholars there. He's going all out and shows some top tier skills that impress them all. Mostly Wilfried scholars because, well, they've never actually seen Ferdinand brew before. But once they're done, Rosemine notes just how overboard he went. She offers to heal him and he accepts. In fact, even the retainers are looking pretty tired, so she makes Flute Rane's staff to heal them all. Well, Ferdinand's astounded by this. Just how much progress has she made in a single season? Probably too much. She says she can make two divine instruments at once, just like how the knights can, and even the royal family agreed. Hell, she's expecting to eventually make multiple shields like he can. Ferdinand pinches his eyes closed at that remark, saying that's a terrible comparison, before just giving up on the topic and washing his hands of it. Okay, so this basically recontextualizes the scene with Anastasius during the dedication ritual last volume. To clarify, he's talking about her making two divine instruments during the ritual, which she kind of implies are just weapons and tools to her, which is why he said that creating two weapons is only taught during the knight's course, so she shouldn't know how to do it. However, what she was talking about was taking inspiration from Ferdinand and the record of a previous scent in the underground archive to make two stops. Also, this is a good time to address a mistake I made in my last video. I put in my on-screen text that Anastasia said making two stops is taught in the Knight's course, but we don't actually have confirmation on that. Whether knights are taught to create two stops for two weapons, or whether there's a spell to create two weapons, isn't explicitly stated as of the point I'm recording this video. So, it's kind of up to interpretation. Anyway, Rosemind says Ferdinand could probably sell his higher quality rejuvenation potion recipe to the royal family as a way to offset Detlin's future fuck-ups, and he's suddenly deathly serious. If she knows Detlin is gonna try something, she needs to tell him so he can put a stop to it. So she tells him about the hairpins and plant light show to outdo the royal family, and yeah, that is pretty serious. Ferdinand will have to try and stop her. But where did she get this idea? Well, Rosemine, unfortunately, but hers was purely an accident, she swears. But their time is almost up. They need to go to bed soon, and since Sergius is originally from Juanchal, he might be able to contact Letizia's parents to get some words of encouragement recorded for her. So after confirming just that, they give him the tool and Rosemine throws in a few words of encouragement herself. Mostly just to fight off Ferdinand's harsh words. That annoys him, but she's still not done, and hands over the shoe mill she made at the start of the book to Eustace. Ferdinand demands to hear the recordings on it so he can judge for himself, and while he and Rosemine argue over it, much to Eustace's amusement, Sylvester interrupts to send the kids off to bed. It's time to have a bottle of wine and chat with his little brother. And the next morning, she's woken up extra early to a very special surprise. She actually got permission to have breakfast with Ferdinand, despite originally being told she couldn't. They need to clean up the tea party room after Ferdinand leaves so that students from other duchies can come pick up Ehrenfest students for the graduation ceremony. So they didn't think there'd be time to host breakfast. Turns out the bench was a huge hit. It was more comfortable than he expected, and he slept longer than he should've. But having attendance still means that he's up and moving at least. He does another checkup on Rosemine, and turns out she's fine. She really is getting healthier, despite all of her recent bouts with fevers. As they eat, Rosemine asks what he and Sylvester discussed the previous night, and he's very evasive about it. Why is that? Well, it does come up in a few volumes, so hold off on it. After they finish, Eustace places a bag with two sound recorders on the table for Rosemine, one that surely has lines from Ferdinand that contain praise. Right? No. Turns out they're mostly warnings, since that's what her attendants wanted. So she plays one and it's a pretty rude message, telling her to stop what she's doing to eat. Yeah, she should probably stop messing with that tool right now. Ferdinand's getting really annoyed. He gets her to stop by telling her to use the one extra in the bag that he gave her to further their research and inform him of the results. Ferdinand then actually keeps the last of the four tools he brewed. So one goes to Letizia, one to Rosemine, one to Research, and one to Ferdinand. He surely got a use for it already planned. But this basically concludes their time together. Ferdinand thanks her for all she did because this really was a nice, relaxing stay. Before both she and Riarda tear up, they head to the common room so Ferdinand can get changed. As the guardians arrive, Cornelius and Hartmut come in their best attire. She encourages Hartmut to go see Clarissa sooner rather than later, or else she's very likely to kick down their door in excitement. But as it stands, he did receive permission to marry her despite his circumstances. Her parents basically thought it was the safest bet. But just then, an adult scholar comes to greet Rosemine. This is Thorsten, one of Wilfried's retainers. And as it turns out, Lisa let us partner. It's kind of been a while since we thought about it, but uh, she's graduating too. And honestly, he should be a good fit for her, personality-wise. At least at first glance. Screw this guy. 
Next, Sylvester comes to the dorm with Florencia in tow. She's looking visibly pale, but she wouldn't miss this for the world, since she views it as one of her duties as the first wife. But before Rosemine can hound her too much and possibly spoil the surprise, she shoot away to the auditorium before them. This year, Rosemine actually sits with the Archducal couple. Since she's not attending as Cornelius' sister, that'll also help dissuade some of the rumors that she's mistreated. Wilfried and Charlotte ask if Florencia made it, but Rosemine tells them that she's there and still feeling sick, so she's resting a bit before the actual ceremony. She can't even tell her siblings what's up due to the problems it would cause. Since Sylvester got a lot of second wife proposals last year, so they're waiting to announce it until they get back to Aaronfest. But when he and Florencia actually arrive, it's time for the student center, and the first one to draw attention is Detlund, of course. It's been four volumes since this monstrosity was conceived, so let's see it in action. Can't help but wonder how Georgine is viewing this, and when they glance over, she doesn't really seem that interested at all. Hell, not an ounce of shame. Did she fail to stop her daughter or what? Probably not, because I doubt she actually cared enough to even try. And don't get it wrong, Detlind is actually loving all this attention. Poor Ferdinand, though. He looks like he's about to die inside. The ceremony proceeds. The music and sword dance starring Leonor is a massive highlight, but the real show is obviously going to be the dedication whirl. Lestalot looks disgusted having to whirl with Detlind, but he manages to get through it by choosing not to look at her and instead looking past her. I don't blame him. Yeah, she's actually gonna whirl with her hair done up in a huge, towering mess of ribbons, lace, and ornaments. Once the whirl is going, the magic circle only Rosemine and Ferdinand can see appears on stage again. But Detlin, the dancing Christmas tree, actually outshines it, as she's pouring mana into her charms to glow like Rosemine did. That's distracting everyone, not just her, because she can't actually keep the damn things lit. Why is that? Well, the mana keeps getting drained out. In fact, uh... She's starting to look kind of exhausted, and she keeps forcing mana into the face stones to keep her light show going. Eventually, she exhausts her mana and passes out mid-whirl and crashes into Lestalot. Because he wasn't looking at her, he takes the hit head-on, causing the whirl to come to an abrupt halt. And after getting hit by him, Detlind falls back onto another girl. But that's still not all. The magic circle lit up, and suddenly, everyone could see it. But only for a brief moment. It's fine. I'm sure this won't be a massive impetus for the rest of the conflict in this story going forward. Okay, so people are asking about the circle now, but Ferdinand is already sending a meaningful look to Rosemine telling her to shut it. The Sovereign High Bishop says a religious ceremony can't be interrupted, and it has to continue. But that's gonna be hard. The Goddess of Light is out cold. In the chaos, Ferdinand orders the people from Arnsbach to get up and drag Detlind off stage. He gets up there himself and offers healing to the girl that Detlind fell onto, apologizing for her mess. They get Detlind out of the Goddess of Light's robe and pass it off to an understudy before leaving the hall entirely. With that, the rest of the graduation ceremony goes off without incident. Back in the dorm for lunch, Wilfried mentions how Detlind really was full of surprises. No shit. Leonor and Lisa Letta couldn't really see from their seats below the stage, so they had no idea there was a magic circle. But that magic circle does remind Wilfried and Charlotte of the one they saw in Haldenzell, making Sylvester ask if Rosemine recognized it. So she lies and says she doesn't, but Sylvester doesn't believe her, and they really don't have much time to speculate anyways. An ordinance arrives from Eglantine requesting an urgent meeting. They're sending a messenger to Aaronfest Tea Party Room right now. Can she just have one graduation ceremony where things don't get completely out of hand? I guess not. So Sylvester tells her to respond and they head on over to the tea party room, clearing it out of retainers ahead of time, knowing they're gonna have to anyway. Oswin arrives a short bit later and puts down a sound blocking magic tool to keep the message private. As it turns out, during lunch, the Sovereign High Bishop says that old records in the temple describe the circle they saw today as one for selecting the next Zent. So a proper king is apparently about to appear and replace the current Grucha's heightless ruler. So Anastasius wishes to hear if that is indeed the case, and if Detlind of all people is closest to taking the throne. His dad is willing to cede the throne if she actually manages to secure the Grucha site. So, Detlind? The next Zent? Hell no. Oswin explains that Rosemine is the only person outside the Sovereign Temple the royal family can turn to about religious matters. Sylvester speaks up, saying she doesn't know anything since this isn't a ceremony performed in Aaronfest. But regardless, there's a royal summons attached, so he's sending her anyway. But adds to include Ferdinand of Arnsbach with the excuse that this concerns his fiancée. So after Oswin leaves with his reply, Sylvester tells her he made sure she'll have someone there to back her up at least. And he summons Karstadt to accompany her too, 
since he wasn't at the graduation ceremony and won't look suspicious being absent. So it's finally happening, we're gonna have the air cleared around Ferdinand and the royal family. This is a pretty important discussion that frames what the royal family's motivations have been to this point. So in Anastasius' villa, Eglantine is there by herself to do this discussion. Yeah, obviously Anastasius couldn't miss the ceremony without raising suspicions, but they drop another area sound blocker and get to a pretty frank discussion. Noble euphemisms would just go over Rosemine's head anyway, so this is for the best. And she explains that at lunch, the Sovereign High Bishop and High Priest drop that nugget on the circle being for selecting the next Zent, causing a massive stir. Traurquals retainers were split in a few camps here, the ones who had been with him since, like, forever, were basically saying that he deserves the Gertrude himself for all of his hard work, while those who joined him after the Civil War were more concerned about Det Lin being the next Zent, especially if they had actually attended the Academy with her. I don't blame him. While others still, and I couldn't imagine who, claim that this must be Ferdinand manipulating her after losing control of Rosemind. However, at the end of the day, the king understands that the Gertrude is essential for the job, and he's willing to give up the throne to whoever obtains it. But wait, you may have noticed that little line right there. If they think Ferdinand was so close to getting the Gertrude why the hell did they stop him and send him to Arnsbach? Well, simply put, duchy of origin matters. A middle, lower population, neutral duchy like Ehrenfest getting the Gertrude would only lead to more conflict. They don't have the political allies and support in the sovereignty to actually build a faction to rule the country, likely leading to another assassination and ensuing civil war. Hell, the last round had started because the first prince resented his brother for getting the Gertrude over him, so he killed him to take it for himself. However, that obviously didn't go as planned. So he thought the third prince, the second prince's maternal brother, had the Gertrude and thus started the civil war. So is Detlind a good or, hell, even acceptable choice? Not really. But when the alternative is civil war, they'll give her the throne. And the hope is having Ferdinand by her side would keep her under control, despite the fact that would kill him inside. So she asks again if Rosemine knows anything about the magic circle. And Rosemine repeats the exact same excuse as before about whirling being a sovereign ritual and not knowing shit. I mean, granted, the Bible does have that circle in it, and it does say something about being the next Zent, but she can't be sure what that actually entails. So Rosemine reassures her that Ferdinand should be able to explain pretty much everything when he gets there, as the Underground Archive has a ton on religious ceremonies, and he's read pretty much everything in it. And this is what makes the king so relatable. He's not holding power because he wants it, he's holding it because he has to. As soon as somebody more suitable pops up, he's handing over the reins, assuming they're able to effectively rule the country in a stable way. And speak of the devil, Ferdinand shows up with Eckhart and Eustace. When Ferdinand sits down, he immediately lays out ways to absolve himself of Detlin's blunders. Using the sound recorder, he got the entire conversation of him trying to get her to remove some of the hairpins. But uh, that wasn't what this was about. They want to know about the circle that they saw. They get him up to speed on the situation, and he's more impressed the Sovereign Temple can even read that much of the Bible in the first place. But for the brief second that it was visible, they actually managed to identify that magic circle? What a time to be weirdly insightful. Anyway, chances are it's in a transcription in their book room from someone who could actually read the Bible back in the day. But just to be clear, they're not entirely right. Ferdinand's pretty annoyed about this, but he's stressed multiple times that they should see the Underground Archive for themselves through Rosemite. So why haven't they done that? Did she slack on her assignment? No. And it does slip that she actually went in, but she had a royal decree as an excuse, right? Eglantine backs her up. After all, she can actually understand the old language written in the archive, but Ferdinand tells them that they should study it too. It only took Rosemine about a season to get up to speed while running a workshop and orphanage. So surely they can do that, but they need her to interpret the archive during the Archduke conference so they'll already have the information soon. Or not. That probably won't happen, because Ferdinand has noticed her little quirk, how she always tackles a new bookshelf in top left to bottom right order, and the information they need is actually on the bottom right. Since they don't really have time for this, Ferdinand will just give them the answers they seek, but they do need to learn the old language sooner rather than later. If the archive is written in a language too old for them to understand, then surely the Book of Mestianora is written in an even older language still. Now, this is a magic circle for identifying Zent candidates, but Detlin failed to activate the circle. The dedication world used to be a selection process to see who had the mana necessary to become a Zent in the past. That's why only the best and brightest royals and archduke candidates perform it, ostensibly. But Anastasius nor Eglantine activated the circle, 
Yeah, because they didn't actually offer prayers and mana when doing so. Try that and it should activate. But I guess the real question is, what about Rosemine? Can't they just have her help them out since she knows so much about prayer and rituals? Ferdinand puts his foot down here. She would surely activate it easier than Det Lin due to her mana quantity and also the frequency with which she prays. However, he wouldn't want to raise suspicion on them any more than he already has. On top of that, he throws it up in their face that Arenfest cannot support his end, as they surely told him when he was summoned by the king last Archduke conference. But if they make a ton of people do this, Zent candidates could show up from every single duchy, which would only sow even more chaos, so they need to keep this information to the royal family alone. So finally Ferdinand puts some sense to this situation for them, but there is a looming question on Eglantine's mind. Since they're speaking frankly behind a sound blocker and all, might as well ask it, right? So what are his thoughts that people say that he's using Rosemine and Det Lin to search for the Gertrude site himself? Raublu comes to mind here, but Ferdinand doesn't really fight the accusation. However, Rosemine does. She says the Zent surrounds himself with idiots, and Ferdinand only wants to do research. He only went to Arensbach because the king ordered it in the first place, after he initially refused the proposal. Ferdinand scolds her, but what she said is true, and despite him saying that he and his personal feelings don't matter in this, she says that he does. So she flat out says that Ferdinand is his happiest when he's locked away in a workshop doing research, not ruling a country. That breaks the tension, and Eglantine teases him a bit by asking if that's true. So he dresses it up a bit, and says he has no intention of becoming Zent, because a good Zent would have to give up everything for the country, and he doesn't want to do that. With that settled, Eglantine brings up their research with Klausenberg again, and Rosemine says that it'd be too much of a burden for Ehrenfest. But at this point, it doesn't really seem like research. Hell, Klausenberg is most likely just using this to butter up the king even more, and after telling them this is probably too much of a burden for any duchy honestly, their best bet is to involve the Sovereign Temple and provide priests and instruments. So they call it there, with plans to talk it over with the king and the Ob of Klausenberg. Well, things spun out of control again, but at least they were able to set some of this crap straight, so Ferdinand doesn't look so suspicious. After they leave, they can't really discuss what happened without sound blockers, so they just stick to the joint research instead. Ferdinand scolds her because her conditions are pretty damn laughable. It'll surely become a yearly occurrence, but she doesn't really care. Melchior will take over after she graduates, and Florencia's new kid will be there after that, on top of Wilfried's kid in the academy next. Wait, wouldn't that make her the mother? That's weird. Either way, there's likely to be trouble on the horizon with the Sovereign Temple and this whole Starbine thing in spring. As much as Ferdinand hopes she avoids trouble, she always ends up charging on into it. That's when he takes his leave, and it's just her, Riarda, and Karstedt in the dorm now. Yeah, it was kinda sad seeing Ferdinand go to a different duchy, despite his cape color. Once inside, Karstedt gives her a pat on the head for coming first in class again. Yeah, this seems a bit weird because Karstedt is a genuinely loving father, but rarely actually gets to be there for Rosemine like this, mostly because he's on duty all the time, so it's a pretty cute moment. She tries to ask about home, but they don't want to bring that drama into the dorm, because it'll ruin the atmosphere, even if there's no one there. After Wilfried comes back, he tells Rosemine Hannah Laura wants to drop off a new book and all of Lestalot's illustrations before they leave, so they have to schedule that for two days out. But there's very little time to relax, because there's a family meeting that has to take place. I wonder what this could be about. Sylvester summarizes the graduation ceremony, where the High Bishop announced the Magic Circle's purpose, that's out in the open now. We get confirmation here that they discovered the circle in their book room, and we're all pretty stoked to see it actually appear in person. On the bright side though, most of the attending nobles doubted this because of how badly Detland embarrassed herself. But when Sylvester wants to know what happened on her end, because Detland becoming Zent would impact Arenfest quite a bit, being Arensbach's neighbor and everything, and according to Ferdinand, she didn't activate the circle and thus, isn't qualified to be Zent. From there, she explains how she finally cleared up the suspicion around Ferdinand, at least a bit by getting Eglantine on her side, and they do need to negotiate with Klausenberg properly about this research, and that about covers it. We've got some wrap-up to do. The next day, Florencia is raced back home because of her health. Rosemine sorts through the reports and manuscripts to get a head start on that crap, while the graduating students head out to repeat their rituals. Most who ended up getting new protections were knights, which makes some sense. They'd all been doing a ton of praying lately. But Leonor and Alexis got on grief, and Steifa Brisa, the goddess of the gale. And Lisa Letta broke the trend by gaining protection from Hellschmeers, because she was healing the knights during practice. That's cool, and I'm brand for her. And the day after that, it's time for her tea party with Hannah Laura. 
but she's actually handing over two massive volumes to Rosemine rather than just one. Why's that? Well, Rosemine has given her quite a few books this year, on top of the apology for all that ditter crap, so it's only fair. Plus, there's a huge pile of artwork too. Yeah, not just the ditter story illustrations. Hell, sorting through them, Rosemine finds quite a few of herself. Yeah, there's a makeshift flipbook in there, but the one that really caught her eye was of the world, which feels like it got put through Wilma's Ferdinand filter. Yeah, apparently Lestalot was so taken, he had to capture it as soon as possible, but Anna Laura's unfortunate timing popped up again. She was so focused on her own world to actually notice. Well, this could be dangerous, especially if Hartmut saw it. So she better seal it away then. Maybe that's how Ferdinand felt back in part three. But this does raise the question, does Lestalot like whirling or something? Maybe, because Hannah Laura confirms that he has drawn Eglantine as well. Damn, that is some pretty high praise. That brings up the disaster at the graduation ceremony, obviously, where Lestalot was truly shocked. He wasn't sure what to actually do. So you know how adult women putting their hair up has been a detail since literally the first volume of this book? After 24 volumes, we finally get an answer. It's because adult women only put their hair down in bed, so it's a privilege for their husbands and the attendants who serve them. Basically something you only see during intimacy. So a girl having her hair down in public is essentially a sign she's not mature. Hence why you only put it up after you come of age. Or you're an utter disgrace. You pick. Detlin's hair came undone on top of her collapsing. So this was a huge embarrassment for not just her, but all of Arensbach. Lestalot didn't even know if it was okay to touch her in that state, you know, with her fiancé so close by. They chat a bit about the upcoming Archduke conference where they'll both attend, the Interduchy tournament of course, and ultimately settle on romance. Hannah Laura finally asks Rosemine what type of man she likes, and this is a bit of a dilemma. In the past she had mentioned liking a smart guy who never backs down, but that was a bit of a throwaway remark. Does she actually have a crush? Not really. Well, better rely on a line she used in her past life and just make somebody up. So she says there is someone she likes, despite her engagement, and vague posts about them supporting her since before her baptism. And despite not seeing each other that much anymore, their promises from back then still keep her going. I do want to point out, she's using Lutz as a model here, but who the hell else are her retainers going to think about when hearing that? In turn, Rosemine slides on into Hannah Laura's DMs and asks her what her type is and she similarly vague posts about a guy who's the opposite of her brother. Though, we know who her crush actually is. And with that, Rosemine's third year in the Academy draws to a close. The Rosemine and Ferdinand ship is actually setting sail, despite the two involved trying to sink it at every turn. The epilogue picks up from Martina's perspective. She's trying to drag Det Lynn back to Arnsbach because she has a mountain of crap to do, and she's caused enough problems already. But dealing with Det Lind is like dealing with a toddler. You can't upset her or else you're in for a tantrum. Luckily, she's gotten pretty good at handling her. Usually, graduating students are like the last people out the door, so that way they can spend their precious last moments in the academy with friends. But Archduke candidates don't really have that privilege, especially one in Det Lynn's situation. None of her other attendants can leave until she does, so the lower years kinda need her to go so they can go home. Also, even those in her service hate her selfishness, with her attendants grades suffering because of her antics. After they get her out of the dorm, Martina breathes a sigh of relief, and she talks to another one of Detlin's retainers, Fatia. She's a student from former work stock attending through Arnsbach, but won't be around for too much longer due to her marrying out of the duchy. Hell, she just graduated this year. They each have something to envy about the other. Sure, Fatia gets to leave, but Martina gets a year in the academy without Detlind ruining it. But the odds of her marrying out of the duchy are zero. Detlind favors her quite a bit, and she's unlikely to get away. Her father pushed her into Georgine's faction to make sure his eggs weren't all in one basket. The children from his other wives seem to have gone into the first wife's faction, so the third wife from Frembeltag's children all went to Georgine. Sad as it is, Fatia tells her that if she had been born in another duchy, she would have been an Archduke candidate herself, because her father was one. Too bad for that stupid law in Arnsbach. We already know about her family's circumstances through Aurelia, but because she was so close to Detlin's age, she was able to become her retainer. The political climate of Arnsbach was a fucking nightmare back then. With the second wife's family demoted in status, Georgine's son suddenly being the only male heir, and not favored by the noble population at all. And then the first wife getting Letizia adopted in created a huge split. That is until Georgine won over the workstock nobles and absorbed the second wife's faction, creating her own power base. However, when Wolfram died, 
Harnsbach was in a panic. Suddenly, they didn't have any good heirs. Martina laments her sister, Aurelia's ineptitude at being a spy in Ehrenfest, since that's the whole reason Georgine intervened in her marriage, thus proving herself pretty damn useless. Hell, Aurelia's appearance and meek personality molded Martina to be outwardly positive and bubbly to get close to people, and it paid off. Georgine ordered her to serve as Detlin's attendant, and she agreed despite wanting to be a scholar in service of Georgine herself. But when it came time for her training, what her father thought was going to be a great boon turned into a trap to control the flow of information into her house. Yeah, Georgine's great at politics, as we already know. That does raise the question, how the hell is Detlin like that then? Well, she's an exception, because the rest of Georgine's children were apparently pretty normal Archduke candidates. Their goal as retainers was to keep her from embarrassing herself, and it was a full-time job. So they spend some time badmouthing her when she's not around. That collapse at the graduation ceremony was the grand finale to her parade of fuck-ups. Ferdinand was summoned away while she was asleep, and they had assumed that he'd be rebuked for that incident. But when word of her becoming a Zent candidate spread like wildfire, the mood in the dorm suddenly lightened. Though that was definitely just a distraction. Nobody wanted to think about that faux pas. Even when Ferdinand came back and said that she actually failed the selection process. They disregarded that report because it let them ignore just how much she shamed herself. They even used that little fact to cheer her up after her collapse. But as happy as they are that it's finally over, the ride, as they say, never really ends. Detland was summoned by Georgine and the retainers were all kicked out of the room for a private chat. They're expecting this to be the worst case scenario, her being told that she's just going to be a temporary ob, but something does catch Martina's eye, Georgine's new retainers. Specifically, one scholarly dude with a magic tool prosthesis. That's payoff for those who are paying attention back in Volume 1 of this part. They talk about how Detlind will handle the news. After being forced by royal decree to marry Ferdinand and adopt Letizia, and then she has to give up her seat as Archduchess to Letizia when she comes of age. Will she really even go along with that? Especially being high on this whole Zent candidate crap? Martina isn't even humoring it at all, since Arnsbach needs an op. But as a thought, once they're married, they can just adopt Detlin's sister's daughter who's being raised quite well. It would also help increase the number of Archduke candidates. Because Arnsbach is in dire straits. I mean, she'll at least be more reliable than Ferdinand, right? Hell, an Archduke candidate with an unknown mother from a backwater duchy like Ehrenfest? They can't even sense his mana, so he must be on the lower end of Archnoble at best. But they're interrupted by an adult retainer saying Ferdinand is actually impressing the scholars quite a bit with his administrative skills. But that doesn't equate to an abundance of mana. With the meeting over, Detlind returns to her chambers in a much better mood than they were expecting. Apparently, Georgine gave her a year to find the Gertrusite. If she fails, she'll just become Ob. Her plan, though, is to reinstate her sister to Archduke candidate status as soon as she's Zent and make her husband the Ob. In the meantime, though, to keep Arnsbach running, she'll make Letizia do mana replenishment. Surely she can manage, since she's supposed to be the Ob by royal decree. Yeah, it turns out Detlind was told, and she's very bitter about it. To help with their mana shortage in the meantime, she's gonna have Ferdinand oversee the religious ceremonies in the temple and help out with spring prayer. Hell, she even plans to end their engagement should she become Zent, literally just using him. So, fuck Detlind. After making some petty plans about ruining Adolfina's and Eglantine's lives, her retainers pose the very real possibility. What if Ferdinand doesn't wish to end their engagement? Well, pretty simple. She'll have him give his name and just order it. In fact, why doesn't she do that right now? So she summons him, and he comes in with his usual smile. <laughs> There's zero ceremony here. She just flat out demands his name, saying he should have given it to her a long time ago. Ferdinand feigns shock for a moment, and then puts his smile right back on. He plays dumb at first, but hits her with a very harsh truth. He has no name to give meaning somebody already has it. He tells her this is the second time a woman has demanded his name. The first was Veronica, and the resemblance is uncanny. Detlind wants him to go get it back, but he can't exactly go back to Ehrenfest. Now can he? She yells at him, calling him useless as the misunderstanding festers. But understand something key, something none of the characters actually noticed. Ferdinand never said he actually gave Veronica his name. After this epilogue, we understand even less of Georgine's motives at this point. Her actions are too deliberate to be random, but what's her end goal? We just don't know yet. But based on the way she was talking to Detlin, she obviously doesn't care about Arensbach, or hell, even her daughter for that matter. As well as the shocking revelation that Ferdinand has already given his name to another. To who and where is his name stone? That's a mystery for a future installment. For now though, we've got side stories to get through.
First up is Resolve at the Interduchy Tournament from Luarati's perspective. This isn't a super important side story in the grand scheme of things, it mostly just shows our main cast from an outside perspective. At the tournament, Yasbrenner is barely high enough ranked to wander around in the morning, but Ehrenfest is too busy to actually visit with, mostly because Dunkelfelger rushed in first, so Luarati is taking a look at the other research. Her first stop is to see her bestie, Muriella. The fact that her own name is on this research with royalty is a huge deal, but Muriella gasps and draws Luarati's attention to Det Lind arriving to talk to Ehrenfest and Dunkelfelger. But who is this handsome man with them? He looks like the mysterious stranger who appeared to slay the Ternesby Fallen last year. But Muriella fills in the details that this is the one and only Ferdinand, Aub Ehrenfest's paternal half-brother, the man who raised Rosemine in the temple, and engaged to Det Lind of Arnsbach. Neat. But from their vantage point, he seems kinda handsy with Rosemine, right? He touched her cheek, which Luarati and Muriella take to mean that romance is in the air, despite both of them being engaged to other people. Felina breaks that immersion to say she must have done something worthy of a pinch. That's when Muriella tells Luarati to go check out their joint research with Arnsbach, as she'll enjoy it for sure. So she heads on over, and we get some info about how this tournament is actually set up. Positions in the arena are dictated by rank, as we already know, but even and odd ranks are on opposite sides, though that is changed when there is a conflict. <laughs> like say one duchy tried to steal another's research, they get separated when that happens, so it's not always one to one. However, she finally sees the shoe mill, and it's speaking lines from the Royal Academy love stories. Rel Arm is boasting about this being their research while Rymoon tries to include Ehrenfest's contributions, but he's forced to just give the presentation eventually. But we know how this goes. Lou Roddy finally gets to the advertisement at the end, and Frau Arm races off to go send a pissed off ordinance. When she returns to Ehrenfest's spot to gush to Muriella, we finally get a glimpse on why Rosemine doesn't understand the romance stories in this world at all. But Muriella does pitch the idea of writing a story to Lua Roddy, since Rosemine is buying manuscripts. I mean, she couldn't do that though, right? Because she's an arch scholar? And that sounds like lay noble work. However, after hearing that the original authors of the Royal Academy love stories are all arch noble housewives, she starts to reconsider. But honestly, she just wants to marry into Ehrenfest, and Muriella says she'll inquire about it from her lady once things settle down back home. But while there's a taboo in Ehrenfest about writing love stories for students currently attending, Lua Roddy could get around that quite easily. And she thinks to herself about maybe writing some shipping fanfiction about the Goddess of Wisdom with Rosemine as the basis. Next, we have my daughter's perspective and resolve from Sieglinda's perspective. After they take their leave from Ehrenfest, she's fighting a massive headache. Her initial intentions were to help get two romances off the ground. One between Lestalot and Rosemine, and the other between Hannah Laura and Wilfried. But there was a fundamental misunderstanding there, and Det Lynn didn't help that headache either. In fact, her attitude was probably why Ehrenfest has such a low opinion of greater duchies, considering Arensbach is their main neighbor. But there are more pressing matters besides that, and hell, even that trug crap. She says to have the tea party room prepared so her family can eat without their retainers when they get back home. She needs to figure out what to do with this whole Hannah Laura situation, so she gives her a sound blocker and asks her plainly her thoughts. Since clearly Lestalot heavily biased their reports in his favor, why the hell did Raufen of all people mistake Bride Stealing Dinner for Bride Taking? They're completely different forms of the game, and he should know better. Here's our confirmation on how they differ, that I've already gone over in my last video, so I'm gonna kinda skip that part. But she assumed that Rosemine returned Lestalot's feelings, so why didn't Hannah Laura correct this in her reports home? If she had said something, they wouldn't have gone into these negotiations based off a misunderstanding in the first place. While Hannah Laura was kept away from the preparations, she didn't know Lestalot's feelings were an act until Anastasius interfered. The contract was another big issue. Ehrenfest not recognizing it as one was kinda weird, but dinner contracts aren't super common outside Dunkelfelger. Hell, they're not even super formal. They even use wooden boards sometimes. So this was basically a massive plot to trick Ehrenfest into a one-sided match. Sieglinda isn't too familiar with other duchies since, well, she's from Dunkelfelger in the first place. Normally she would be a second wife, but the circumstances came about during the Civil War. The previous Ob had forbidden his son from taking a wife outside their duchy so they wouldn't be forced onto a single side. So it was sort of a fluke that she ended up in her position. But even assuming Hannah Laura knew anything in this situation, could she have actually stopped the dinner match from taking place? The answer is no. 
No one was listening to her and they were too pumped up for it. But Hannah Laura also isn't the most trustworthy person here. So Sieglinda finally asks when she made her decision she wanted to marry into Aaronfest. And when she learns it was in the middle of the game, that damn near makes her topple over. That's the sort of impulsive behavior that would have deemed her a failure of an Archduke candidate. So clearly their love isn't mutual. But Hannah Laura still has hope, since Wilfrey didn't deny the terms when signing the contract. But still, she doesn't want to cause any more problems, and finally comes clean about everything that Lestalot and her dad have been hiding from her mom. All the crap they've glossed over with their relationship with Aaronfest, which makes her realize they probably come off as the most annoying jerks in the world. But that also doesn't change that Hannah Laura took her enemy's hand and betrayed her duchy and the knights who fought for her sake. Now, her marrying into Aaronfest would have been a net benefit, so she probably wouldn't have been punished too harshly had that happened. But that's out the window now since she's refusing to marry in. Because then, for what reason did she lose them the game? Hannah Laura pretty much just accepts that. And as her mother, Sieglinda worries for her future, because things won't go smoothly. But putting that aside, for now, they have to go lecture the men in their family. And lastly, we have Suspicions and Gay Venon, the side story that ruins Wilfried for the audience from his perspective. After dinner with Ferdinand, Wilfried is feeling pretty overwhelmed by everything he experienced that day, but Oswald drops an annoying observation on him, how close Rosemine and Ferdinand were. <laughs> Did Wilfried really not think anything of it? He was only shocked because it reminded him of how he used to be with Veronica, relaxed and vulnerable. But Oswald presses it by saying it was inappropriate for him to touch her like that since he's not a citizen of Aaronfest anymore. Yeah, he's not her primary doctor. They're both engaged to other people, and Wilfried should be more conscious of that fact now that he's developed mana sensing. Oh, turns out our boy is growing up somewhat. It happened after his return to the Royal Academy, but he got super nervous whenever he felt somebody else's mana, and he had to get used to not looking around whenever it happened. But why should he feel anything for Rosemine? She hasn't developed mana sensing yet, so she's basically still just a kid to him. Not being able to sense one another's mana usually leads to an unhappy marriage. And on an instinctual level, you usually don't even consider them in that way. But of course, Oswald blames them, because Ferdinand and Rosemont should know better. If she's not careful, she'll only draw more proposals. And suddenly Wilfried remembers all that awful shit Lestalot said to him last volume. But Oswald keeps going, saying Rosemine shouldn't be standing out in the first place, and it's an affront to his position as the next Archduke. He doesn't think she shows Wilfried any respect. Wilfried mostly brushes the criticism off, because she knows more about the stuff she took charge in than he does. But Oswald continues to stick to Veronica's methods, and that everyone should offer up their success to Wilfried to prop him up. Though Wilfried declined Rosemine doing that initially and told her to go on stage for the award ceremony this year. Yeah, now he's starting to get upset because this is starting to sound like his fault. And then Oswald goes even further, saying that he's worried that after the purge, the wise gangs are going to use this opportunity to push for her to be Ob again, and Sylvester should cancel his adoption so that she can go back to just being an arch noble. Wilfred's done listening to this and tells Oswald to shut the hell up, and then heads to bed. The next day, he gets a letter from Ortwin asking for a last minute game of Gavenon. That sounds like fun, but then again, everyone tells him this is likely just to pump him for information. But come on. There's no way. This is his best bro pal we're talking about. He wouldn't do that, right? He accepts, and when he gets there, he feels quite a bit of pride. He can actually sense Ortwin's mana somewhat, meaning he's in the ballpark of an Archduke candidate from a greater duchy. But Ortwin asks him, since he can sense mana now, is he gonna finally prepare a face stone for Rosemine? He hadn't really thought about it, I mean, she's still a kid. Orwin takes that to mean that the nice-ass hair stick that everybody's been complimenting this year was actually just meant to be a placeholder. Oh great, does that mean he has to compete with Ferdinand and try to outdo those with the proposal face stone? God damn. But then Ortwind asks what happened when Rosemine was summoned by the royal family. Wait, how does he know about that? Oh right, Adolfina is marrying Sigiswald. Yeah, it turns out, he did invite him just to get some information. That sucks. Wilfried says they'll probably announce it at the Archduke conference, but they don't really have time for that. Ortwind is trying to protect his big sister, and if Detlin becomes Zent, she'll most likely execute the previous royal family. That's what would happen with a new Ob, so surely kings are the same way. Now his sister would be included if she actually marries Sigiswald. Orwind accidentally adds more fuel to the fire going on in Wilfried's head by asking who went with her to the summons, and suddenly a lot of dots are connecting. He then asks Wilfried what was up with that whole dinner game, or has Rosemine already been decided to be the next Ob? Well, no, she's sickly and adopted. 
so she's not a good fit for the job. <laughs> That's rich to somebody from Juanchal. They view adopted kids as especially gifted, so they're usually more fit than blood children to be of. Obviously, she's striving for the role, else she wouldn't come first in class every year, right? Damn. Now Orwind is pretty much confirming everything Oswald said. Wilfried's suddenly pissed that Rosemine isn't devoted to him like she should be. As their game wraps up, he thanks Ortwind, but that just kind of confuses him. What did he do exactly to be thanked? He doesn't know. He then tells him not to worry about his sister marrying into the royal family. Deadlind isn't qualified to be the next Zent. Wow, that was a lot of information in that last side story, but it really dictates the direction of Rosemine and Wilfried's relationship going forward. Why is it going that way? Well, it's because the Veronica faction is feeling backed into a corner to ensure the Lies Gangs don't get absolute power in Ironfest. But a lot of this won't be resolved for a few more volumes, so let's get into my final thoughts and end this video. This volume works well as a capstone to the third year in the Academy, but we're not quite done yet. This was essentially the prologue for things to come. This winter has seen a huge shift for the whole country, with the revitalization of religious ceremonies, a path forward for the man of poor country, Ehrenfest's internal politics being shaken to their very core, and now the emergence of a Zent candidate could put the entire political structure the country is built upon in jeopardy. How this impacts Rosemine and the people she cares about is yet to be seen, but understand this is the setup for the conflict that's to come in this series. Hell, she's already vowed to come save Ferdinand should anything happen, and Detlind is now at center stage for having made that magic circle appear. Harnsbach and, specifically, Georgine Loyal Nobles have been the main antagonistic force to this point, so finding out how this all comes together is really masterful writing that I can't wait to discuss with you all, but that's gonna have to wait until later books. And that shows with just how much Gabrielle has come full circle in this volume. I know many people were tired of hearing how Gabrielle of Arnsbach ruined Ehrenfest politics and all their struggles really seem to go back to her, but this isn't just internally. In this volume, we got a really interesting outside perspective. Why this had so much buildup was really not just to show how Ehrenfest became so divided and leading into a political purge for some catharsis. But this goes even externally, with Hannah Laura's proposed engagement to Wilfried. What was Sieglinda so worried about? How her daughter might be mistreated. And her greatest concern is another greater Duchy's Archduke candidate forcing a marriage into Ehrenfest. And being demoted down to Archnoble to spend her days in misery is brought up in Hannah Laura's side story. That stigma is still sitting over Ehrenfest's head. And that's kind of the whole point. Gabrielle wasn't just an Ehrenfest problem, it made Ehrenfest look absolutely insane to the outside world. That's why it mattered so much, to set the stage why greater duchies don't view Ehrenfest favorably. These are duchies that pride themselves on their long history and have an even longer memory than most. 60 years is essentially yesterday. And yes, this sort of reasoning comes up in later books, but this is evidenced by how Lestalot mocked Ehrenfest for having a measly 200 years of history. That marriage and subsequent drama was essentially a canon event for Ehrenfest. That caused them a ton of animosity within and earned them the ire of top-ranking duchies, and that forms part of the reason why they're not treated well. One of the biggest reliefs of this book was the royals no longer suspecting Rosemine of plotting treason, which is great and Sylvester securing treatment on par with winning duchies is a good way to improve public perception. But that didn't absolve Ferdinand until Rosemine talked to Eglantine, and got him to open up that he really does understand the plight of the current king, but also doesn't envy his job. But that does touch on an issue here, and one that we'll see become very apparent as Volume 5 wraps up. The sovereignty and royal family by extension have almost no idea how to handle diplomacy with the lower ranked and smaller duchies. The reason why is pretty much never stated, but it is reasonable enough to understand based on the circumstances. The king was raised as a vassal originally, he never had the training for politics, but also doesn't really have that much actual authority. The greater duchies backing him are what gives him his power, and the only way he knows how to placate someone is to do what he does with the greater duchies. The fact that Anastasius asked Sylvester this volume how middle and lesser duchies would feel being consulted about a simple game of ditter in the academy was an idea they never thought of because the graders are the ones who are the most vocal. So as we get later into this story and see the interactions with the royal family, keep in mind their diplomatic strategy and their actions will make a ton more sense. The tensions with Lanzanov were brought up this volume, and we know that accepting the Edelgisa princess was declined. That's presumably the biggest cause of conflict at play, but what I want to draw attention to is the fact that Rosemine's hearing about this from Anastasius. The connection between this country, Harnsbach, Ferdinand, and the sovereignty 
creates a hellish triangle that'll keep coming up in future volumes. This is foreshadowing for many volumes down the line, so just keep in mind that Lanzanov is becoming a player in the story at this point. I talked quite a bit last volume about the purpose of the library, how it's meant to guide qualified candidates down the path of being Zent, and the process is a bit more complicated than that, but here we have the revelation of a Zent candidate for the first time, or at least, how the process would normally go. You would get your divine protections, then your stop, then whirl and be recognized as having enough mana to proceed to the next step. The memoir of the previous Zent we saw in Volume 2 sort of gives away the next step in a cryptic way, but the Royal Academy is essentially a selection ground for the true king to appear. The reason why that is becomes clear much later, but we're already seeing it happen. The connection between the Bible's magic circle and the dedication world stage, the underground archive, and rituals firing off massive pillars of light. All I can say is, spring will be a crazy time, as Rosemine discovers a ton of new information in the archive. But what of Georgine's plan? Detlind was deemed a Zent candidate by the Sovereign Temple, despite her not actually being one, but between making a fool of herself at the graduation ceremony, and her pushing her to search for the Grucha site, despite knowing she likely won't get it, really screams of negligence. Honestly, at this point, it's shrouded in mystery, because Detlind is clearly just a useful pawn in her game. But even who all the pieces are and what connection she has, or hell, even her end goal besides taking Aaronfest's foundation is entirely unknown. I want to make it clear, that's not poor writing, that's just a testament to how skilled Georgine is at scheming, and even the audience with all their points of view can't really piece her plan together, mostly because the elements of it haven't even really come to light, despite the consequences of them already impacting the story. This plot is honestly incredibly well done. I'm excited to talk about it more as it unravels. Probably the biggest note this book could leave off on, or at least the most pressing, is Wilfried's heel turn. It starts now, and after some poisonous ideas planted by Oswald and unwittingly fed by Ortwin, this has at least been festering for a bit now, unbeknownst to Wilfried himself. Because this links back to the Purge and Lestalot's taunts in the previous volume, Hell, even how he was feeling inadequate compared to the Archduke candidates in his class last volume was the first hints of his insecurity that has now grown into a full-blown complex. How the friction between him and Rosemine has been building hasn't really been obvious, but in hindsight, is definitely earned. It even started to boil over when arguing about Det Lind, but this will shape their relationship in the future, as Wilfried has to grapple with a slipping grip on power and dwindling sense of purpose, especially in the face of a new political shift in Aaronfest. One that leads us neatly into next volume. So that's it. We finally wrapped up Rosemine's monumental third year in the Royal Academy. The Interduchy Tournament set the political landscape for the foreseeable future in Jürgenschmidt, but what's on the horizon back home? You're probably expecting a lull in this, but you're not going to get that in Part 5, as the aftermath of The Purge, a visit to Kernberger, and Wilfried's Rage all come to a head. For now though, hey, you've made it to the end of the video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and do all the other YouTube stuff to help the channel grow. You can also join my Discord with a link down in the description. If you really want to support me, you can head on over to my Patreon and pick up some extra perks. And speaking of Patreon, I'd like to give a special thanks to Jmon33A, Pokeflute, RobinDBL, Samuel Chen, Tristan, and Vaughnstern for their continued support. Thanks for watching.